Good morning, and thank you for coming this morning on this dreary day. Uh, I'm John Kelly. I have the blessing of working here, and uh, right now I'm feeling very, very blessed because some of the most important and favorite people in my life are in this room right now. Not only Scott Levin, but uh, my twin brother, Bobby Stoller, other friends uh, that I consider just dear people that I would take a bullet for. And uh, I want to thank Dr. Levin especially for this idea uh, because we know that uh, leadership is talked about, it's just a concept that's out there, but as I get older and as I get into that phase of my life where I want to give back, I start to learn how to do it and I found people like Dr. Yusin, Dr. Kaiser, my good friend Jimmy Gallo and others in this room today that are going to help the young people today learn how to accomplish much in their lifetime. And they're going to learn some very important principles this morning. And this is the first of many conferences. This is going to grow. It's going to become, uh, in the words of Trump, it's going to become huge. It's going to be big. <laughs> because it's an important skill for those of you who wish to have meaning in your lives. I want to thank Kyle Schaefer, who couldn't make it this morning, uh, who was instrumental in helping the uh, logistics. I want to thank Dan Giddings. Dan, please stand up for the audiovisual support for low-budget operations. So he's our AV guy. Let's hear it for Dan, the AV guy. So uh, why are we here? Leadership is the art of influencing others to their maximum performance to accomplish any task, objective, or project. If one wishes to accomplish any worthy goal, find a life of meaning, perfect the most good in your life, you're going to need to learn leadership. It just doesn't happen. I, I, you know, I get a lot of passion, and getting that vision to reality requires not only self-leadership, but also leadership of others. It's a very spiritual principle to me. That's why I'm very excited about this. Because the focus is true leadership, as Dr. Yusin will elaborate later. Focus on the common good. It's selfless. It's cloaked in integrity and morality. And it's necessary to see an endeavor to complete fruition. So why are we here this morning again? Because effective leadership requires skills. It just doesn't happen. These are some of the skills we're going to talk about this morning. Vision, organization, integrity, wisdom, benevolence, and consensus building. But these can be learned. These can be learned. You see, leaders are both born and made. Convinced of that. Where do we get this idea of and I? Well, John Fagan was one of our mentors. He was the first West Point active duty graduate to attend medical school. He was a pioneer in my vocation in sports medicine. He is a mentor to me and others. He embodies what we will kind of call it this morning the servant leader. And these are some of the principles the Fagan leadership model has developed. And look at the center, patient centeredness. That's where the ball game's played. So Scott Levin came to me and we discussed this. We want to have our pen variety of this because we have a lot that we can bring to the table with our resources here. We're going to have a year, we're going to have it. It's not going to just be an ethereal company. We're going to have a yearly forum dedicated to all those who wish to enrich their leadership skills. We're also going to develop a program for the Pan Worth being leadership scholars, and we're going to have a, uh, have a, a cadre of mentors that people like in that back row can come to if they have any life uh, decisions, ideas they wish to see to fruition. And that's going to happen. So I've assembled these people this morning. They all have three things in common. In common. They've all served greatly. Each one of them are people of character, otherwise they wouldn't be here. And they're going to show you the way this morning. So let's get started. So uh, I'm going to bring our keynote speaker. I have the privilege of uh, introducing Mike Yusin here today. Um, he's a professor of management and director of the Center for Leadership and Change Management at Wharton School. He works extensively in education of executives in both U.S. and abroad. And he's the author of eight books on leadership. We are so privileged to have Dr. Yusin join us this morning. Mike, thanks very, very much. We're going to work with a couple of visuals. Anyway, uh, let me get going. Very briefly, uh, great to be here. Uh, always good to be in a room with my friend uh, Larry sitting right here in front, also up there on the wall. And I'm going to uh, do a quick walkthrough, literally in 15 minutes, of the questions that we all ought to be asking about leadership. And I've got a few answers from thought leaders and research and academe and experience. So to <clears throat> kick through these questions we, I think we've always had should be answered, have to be answered, if we're going to go anywhere with this uh, topic. 
Let me start with the uh, kind of the starting question, which was nicely at the bottom of the last slide up here a moment ago. Is leadership natural or can it be acquired? There is a debate about that, a dispute out there. I love John's final point, it can be learned. I happen to be in that camp as well. But keep in mind as you do work with others on their leadership development, some do take the view, it's out there, that leadership is just something you have or don't. We have even a phrase in American English, somebody is a natural born leader. Let me put that over here for a minute. I've got some evidence on that one as well. Uh, number two, second question. When we think about leadership, is it about you? Or with the aid of a little help here, I think we can get this in front of us. Is it about you, or in the case of Disney, is it about Robert Iger, chief executive who's been there for a decade, an amazingly well-performing company, on the front of all kinds of business magazines, and of course, Disney is led by the Bob. Having said that, there is evidence, this is the top team that he has, his direct reports these days, somebody running ABC television, a Disney property, theme parks, uh, Pixar, Star Wars, all Disney properties, these are the people that create and deliver. <coughs> there is an argument that uh, this, just to make it tangibly here in front of us, that this uh, cover of Fortune magazine, typical of business magazine, we put the one on the cover, is actually a little bit of a misleading symbol that uh, is meant to take the reader inside the front cover to read about why Disney is so good because the evidence uh, tends to run this way, that uh, if we want to know where Disney is going, we've got to know a lot about Bob Iger <coughs> equally and statistically. We're going to learn more about the future of Disney's performance and where it's going and how it's led and what the culture is by taking into account the top teams. So second question, just to give that one a sharp edge, is leadership an individual or a team sport? And I think the answer is yes. Third question. Third question. When does your leadership of uh, University of Pennsylvania here, whatever your role may be, or Amy Gutman, president of the university, or the governor, or the mayor, or the president of a country, or the head of a private company for that matter, when does that person's leadership, whatever it may be, we haven't come to that yet, when does that have greatest impact? And if we begin to talk about that, we should, we won't for the reasons of time here. Uh, I think we're going to quickly say, well, certainly during a crisis, we also though as our thinking evolves a bit, are going to say, well, even in good times, got to make certain that we're getting ready for the times ahead. And we may be blinded by our momentary success there, before would somebody kick us in the back and make certain that we don't get uh, ultimately undone by forces that we don't see. I've got evidence, research evidence to put in front of us at least a summary here of a couple of the second and third question. Uh, skip all this right here. Bottom paragraph sums up so much research by academic colleagues that to understand the future of, you name the organization that has got more than a couple people in leadership roles, we're going to learn more by knowing about the top team than the top one. Now, Got to be careful that top one, Bob Iger at Disney, has enormous impact. But the team actually, as a whole, if it's well put together, great strategic understanding of where the heck everybody's going, it seems to do better or make more of a difference than the top one. This paragraph says this. Thinking about the market, the world you're in, the regulatory changes out there, the debates on Capitol Hill, uh, just the, the shifting uh, interest uh, on the part of your, your, your patients in what they're looking for. If there's a fair amount of change out there, your leadership the next five or ten years is going to be more consequential. At least that's what this paragraph says right here, summing up a huge body of literature as well. Periods of uncertainty and change, the mayor, the president, the head of the system here, you have more impact on where we're going. Uh, Third question I'm going to get to very quickly. Fourth question, sorry. Fourth question is, how do we know we can really make a difference? And I think we've all had those thoughts late at night. Well, a huge system. We're locked into the, many of the people that work for us, have a budget that was given to us, can't do much about that. Can one person 
really make that much difference? Well, I've got a, I guess, a case to make the, uh, a single case to make the argument anyway. If you have flown Boeing, any kind of Boeing aircraft, maybe a 737, or if you came across the Atlantic recently, probably a 777, here's the guy that made it for you, at least until a few months ago, Jim McNerney, Chief Executive Officer of Boeing. The equity market, not every day completely rational, my finance colleagues tell me, but some days they seem to have a pretty good uh, thought on what the heck's going on in their universe. And when Jim McNerney left 3M as chief executive making yellow stickums, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, moved to Chicago where Boeing, oddly these days, is headquartered, uh, the equity market spoke. Your retirement funds spoke. Vanguard, Fidelity, State Street, and they took off, look at the little paragraph down here at the bottom, they took off because of one change, one person went from 3M, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Boeing, Chicago, Illinois, one person moving, no other announcements or uh, assertions about how we're gonna meet deadlines when they weren't, coming from Airbus and Boeing, market stable, but Jim McNerney's move to Chicago moved the needle by $3 billion. The value of 3M dropped by three and a half, 3.7 billion. The value of Boeing went up by nearly three billion. So I think it's fair to say, as a reporter did, huh, Jim McNerney, the three billion dollar man. Because his leadership in five days was worth three billion. You're gonna tell me that sometimes markets are a little bit exuberant, so I'll move back from the example and bring up a statistic here. Take a look at this. This has often been done on sports teams, but we've also got the same kind of analysis here for uh, private, publicly owned companies. Make it uh, 3M. And somebody, <laughs> several people, have taken a bunch of firms, US, large, publicly traded, and asked the question, when the chief executive steps down, who's been there for a while, health, Maybe just age, maybe it's just time to move on. And the board of directors made an unbelievable error in bringing in a well-performing CEO's successor. And then after a few months, maybe a year, the board kind of woke up. What a disaster. Toss that person out. Now, I don't think that happens so much in <coughs> universities, at least that's my own experience, but it does happen a lot in the private sector. For example, it happened at Campbell Soup, just across the river here a couple of years ago. Uh, Procter & Gamble, Hewlett Packard, City, British Airways. And by the way, <clears throat> it's in the, the record book, you can't beat Yahoo, that brought in six CEOs in I think seven years. Terrible for the company, especially for the investors and customers, but great for academics now who can look at what happens when you throw out that poor performing immediate successor, finally get somebody in that seems to be a good successor. It's taken Yahoo a while to do that, Hewlett Packard as well. But if we look at everything netted out and look one to three years ahead, right versus wrong leadership skill set, and here's the key number, as much as 15% up or 15% downward movement in internal metrics of performance. How much difference, if you think about your own office, your own program, can you make, pick a metric, and as much as 30% variance? Can leadership make a difference? It can make a difference, and something in this ballpark is not too far off. To put that a bit differently, other research, more on human resource practices, pretty consistently says this. Poor practices, same kind of company, compared over here that does more or less in the same product area, but great practices. In performance here is X, over here 1.3, maybe 1.4, maybe 1.5 X. Same people, same enterprise. With all that being said, I'm gonna quickly ask you to think about CEO number two versus CEO number one, or think about yourself versus somebody who's behind you, has left before you, and is in front of you, your successor. And very quickly, I've just picked, this is one of many methods of getting all of us to think about uh, what defines great leadership. It's one of many methods. But my method right here is to put up eight photos. I think we recognize at least six. 
we're a little bit stuck with the gentleman above Margaret Thatcher, uh, of local interest, actually. This is Al Sloan, who came in to run General Motors in 1924. The Sloan School at MIT, of course, named after him. Wrote the textbook that we still use. Lower right-hand corner, top-ranking U.S. uniformed officer of World War II. And just to help us appreciate who he is, he will receive the Nobel Prize for Peace. A five-star general officer and a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize for a car, of course, the Marshall Plan. So George Marshall, Mother Teresa, that's a bit of a stretch. What's the common thread? I'd like you to think about that quietly while I bring up some more other evidence. And that is to go to the world of thought leadership, we tend to call on academia anyway. Many of you have read the book by Jim Collins, Can't Beat It. Some of you have read the book by Sheryl Sandberg, the earlier book called Lean In. Both of those in the category of good thought leaders. Many of you have read Walter Isaacson's account of Steve Jobs. Got a faculty colleague outside of Paris, offers a couple of thoughts, and we've got a bunch of faculty members now that spend a lot of time thinking about emotional intelligence, and one of the proponents there is a guy named Daniel Goleman. So let's see, Mother Teresa, George C. Marshall, Nelson Mandela, think of at least one common theme. There's something about probably they've got a vision and they really are determined to bring it into reality. And we draw from a few folks like this and some academic research to go with it. And then borrowing a, a moment out of your uh, professional colleague, I know many of you know, Atul Gawande, wrote this great book a couple years ago, The Checklist Manifesto. I've kind of come to the same conclusion. We ought to think about our own leadership and that that we're developing in others much the same way. And again, drawing on people like Walter Isaacson and Sheryl Sandberg, I end up with this checklist. It's a strong assertion, not under particular items, although I think most of them do make sense. It's a strong statement that we can't do without any of those. Just like the timeout that many of you perform before you begin surgery, just, be, just like the pilot who's about to lift off at Philly International here, that has to go through the pre-flight pilot's checklist, in my view, I've got 15 mission critical items here. Don't wanna, I don't wanna work for somebody, and I bet you can quickly connect with this yourself, who doesn't think strategically, can't make decisions. And most importantly now, for our purposes as we close off, is not good, and thanks to John and Scott for putting on this program, not good at developing leadership in others. It begs the question, it's a great question, I think, maybe the most important of all, along with when does leadership make a difference, is it an individual or a team sport, etc., is given the premise, and here's where I come back to that very first question, that leadership can be strengthened. Some seem to have a head start, but unequivocally we can work on it. What exactly are the avenues for building leadership? Many ways to answer that. I've got just one I picked out of a whole range of academic studies of this. If you ask people at the end of their career, think about people who've retired here recently, who have responsibilities for maybe a department or a practice, and we ask them to look back on how did they learn, say compared to when they were age 10, fifth grade, to do what they do now. Three questions always, three avenues always emerge. Number one, I was just a student of leadership throughout my lifetime. I loved the History Channel. I loved to read uh, biographies of Civil War generals or whatever it might be. I picked up Sheryl Sandberg. Number two, cannot overstate the power of coaching and mentoring. And number three, people say, you know, to be honest, the most profound way that I learn to do what I do now is by doing it, making mistakes, conducting good after-action reviews and making next week better than the prior week. So let me quickly sum up. I've got a pop quiz and then we are going to move on here. Uh, let's see. Is leadership natural or do we acquire it? I think the answer on that one actually is yes too, but don't forget the second part of that. Leadership can be strengthened. Number two, when's the most vital? Arguably next five years. Pretty important. Number three, 
Uh, is it about you or the people around you? And the answer is yes. And then what goes into it? And how much difference can it make? Well, we've touched on both of those. So my pop quiz final summary is this. And I hope some of you, I know some of you know the answer. Who first climbed Mount Everest? Just let's have a shout out on the names. Edmund Hillary. Edmund Hillary and? Edmund Norgay. And Tenzing Norgay, Ed Hillary of New Zealand, Tenzing Norgay of, of course, Nepal and India both claimed them, afterwards anyway. Uh, but who put them on the summit? So well, here's an argument. Uh, they put themselves on the summit. They had a, actually a Camp 7. These days you get up typically to a Camp 4. But in those days, 1953 anyway, the first uh, final assault here on, on the summit, uh, they're up at Camp 7, extremely cold night, Pretty much halfway up this ridge, right over to right about here, there's what becomes known as the Hillary Step. And there's an argument that they were put together, there they are on the right hand side, they were put together really by Eric Shipton and then John Hunt. Eric Shipton, the initial leader of the expedition, but John Hunt, nobody had ever heard of him, army officer in India at the time, a logistics specialist, quartermaster corps for British, the British Army. He concluded after uh, the British had been trying since 1921, Mallory and Irvine disappearing in 1924, and five other expeditions to fail, that it's John Hunt now, that we never reached the summit of Mount Everest because we tend to look at it like climbing uh, Mount Washington in New Hampshire, or maybe Whitney in California, or the Matterhorn in Europe, grab a pack, take a water bottle, and you'll get to the summit by midday. Uh, Everest compared to, let's make it the Matterhorn, or Mount Whitney in California, is three vertical miles higher. And thus, right in the person here, uh, John Hunt, building on what Eric Shipton had done, that did put together a team of Sherpas, nine other climbers, and by the way, they were put together by a board of directors back in the UK, who picked the leaders, helped them form the team, and it is a summary of what we have been referencing. Can one person make a difference? Well, there's Tenzing Norgay, most famous photograph probably ever in the sport of mountaineering. Tenzing Norgay with Ed Hillary just a few feet away, individually a, a monumental achievement. I think you all know if you've ever traveled to New Zealand, Ed Hillary is on the back of the $5 bill, probably be there forever. That said, Let's not forget who helped put them up at Camp Seven, and that's where John Hunt comes in. Maybe that's you. And then being John, behind John Hunt and uh, his predecessor up here is a team back in London, the equivalent of maybe the, the senior staff of the system here, maybe the Board of Trustees of the University of Pennsylvania, who helped set the strategy, pick the team to reach the summit. So, John, that's it. My pleasure. May you all win. Thank you very much. Make sure the kind of man of integrity Mike is, uh, I have a gift for each speaker, and he said, should you be giving this to me after the talk? Yeah. Good point, my friend. Uh, it is with uh, humility, uh, you know, the very few people have the blessing of identical twin brother. It gives you a sense of security. I mean, it's the ultimate in covering my back. And I can go on and on about uh, his athletic accomplishments as a wrestler, boxer, supreme football player, by the way. And Bear Bryant said he need three things to be a good football player, mobile, agile, and hostile. I had the first two right. Mike Kelly had all three. But he's my twin brother, and I couldn't be more proud. He is, in my estimation, wise, the top trial lord in America. And uh, when I was an intern <clears throat> at Chester Crozier, uh, I had to. Li I lived with he and his lovely wife Deanna for about three months because it was next to Wilmington, Delaware, our hometown. And as I might come home at 10 p.m. and leave at 5 a.m. and then come home maybe 48 hours later, he looked at me and he goes, "I'm never going to sue a doctor." He's kept that word. He's a defense guy. He has won more high-profile cases, including those you don't know, with summary judgments, which means that it's not even a question of the outcome. What makes me so proud of my brother is not only is he a bulldog in the courtroom. He's always had that sense of groundedness. And what you don't know about Mike Kelly is, he is fiercely loyal, he's dedicated to his faith, his family, his principles. And the first thing he does when he wins a trial, 
He gives money to the poor. So that's a leader. That's a leader. He has created a culture at the largest law firm which he chairs in Carter English, New Jersey, of fairness, justice, and service. And it's with great pride to have my twin brother Michael talking about how to create a good culture. Thanks, Mike. It's a tough intro to follow. I feel like it's my wig. Um, <laughs> let me uh, say something first about Mr. Uh, Usain. That was really wonderful. And, and uh, I knew to quote our president, I knew you must be smart because you went to Wharton. <laughs> Donald Trump says, hey, I must be smart to Wharton. That was wonderful. You summed up everything I want to say, so there's not much for me to add. <laughs> wonderful. In fact, I uh, hope you don't mind. I took some pictures of your slides, and uh, I'll give you a royalty of... Uh, any money I make, but thank you. Tough act to follow. My twin brother, um, boy, what can I say about him? Um, he's my identical twin, good looking guy. <laughs> uh, we had humble beginnings, actually uh, slept in the same bed when we were children, and not until I got married did I know what it was like to sleep alone in my own bed. <laughs> He talks about me, uh, I, I double what he said about me when I talk about him. He, he's a better athlete, smarter, uh, mom liked him better <laughs> and she liked me. I mean, he's the doctor, right? And he wanted to be a priest. How do I follow that? I'm just a lawyer, but uh, I will follow John Kelly anywhere and that's the highest praise I can uh, give to anyone as far as uh, toughness, integrity, uh, character, and uh, all the things I look for in the leader my brother has. And I'm, I'm honored just to be, and humbled to be part of this. I don't consider myself uh, to be on the same level as these other speakers. And thank you, Dr. Levin, for uh, all you've done for my brother and uh, for allowing me to participate in this. Let me start my remarks. It's tough to add again what Mr. Yassim said, but I want to start with a story about my twin brother. <clears throat> you saw a picture of him and his uh, lovely wife, Marie, like a sister to me. They were lying in bed last night. And I'm sure John won't get mad at uh, me saying this, but John was lying in bed with me watching TV, and he touched Marie on the shoulder, and she got a little excited. And then he touched her a little lower, and she got excited. And then he touched her even a little lower than that, and she got really excited. And then he stopped. And she turned and said, John, why did you stop? He said, I found the remote. <laughs> now, why do I mention that story? You didn't really know where I was going with that, did you? Right? You didn't know where I was going. What's the most important quality of a leader? By far. Where are you leading them? Where are you taking them? Right? Remember that scene in uh, Animal House when uh, <laughs> Dean Warmer revoked uh, the charter of the Delta House and they're all sitting there and they're all moping around and, and they don't know what to do. And then John Blue says, let's go! And he runs out, let's go! He didn't know where they were going, right? All that enthusiasm, he didn't know where they were going. So before you talk about the characteristics of leadership, by far, what's more important is where are you leading them? Where? So you have to be specific. You have to enunciate a plan, and you have to make sure everybody is on the same page. And what's that plan? Well, look. Every dis discipline is different. You talk about a tough job. How about chairing 400 lawyers? You think you got it tough, Dr. Levin? Imagine 400 lawyers when they want to talk about bonuses, right? <laughs> oh my God, it's unbelievable. So you got to have a plan that obviously in the practice of law, money is, is important, right? And I always tell them, I said, folks, it's not all about the Benjamins. The plan is not just about money. Where are we going? We're going to increase profits, and how are we going to do that? But we're also going to achieve certain goals. We're going to uh, 
achieve a greater client base, we're going to achieve greater satisfaction with our clients, we're going to achieve excellence, and, and we're going to give back. We're going to give back. Don't forget that. And I saw the slide of Dr. King who said, let's not forget, society is measured by how we treat the least. By how we treat the least. That's very important to me at McCarter in English. And I'm so proud of all the accomplishments uh, I've had as chairman. And I didn't want the job, by the way. I was drafted uh, in 2009. But we uh, have gotten uh, at least two or three pro bono awards every year in the last seven years. So when you set the goal, make sure it's specific and make sure everybody knows about it and everybody buys in. Nick Saban, you know, John and I played football 13 years, so it's tough to avoid the football analogies, but Nick Saban once said, if an assistant coach is not on the same page as I am, he's out of here. They all got to be on the same page. And you got to explain to them why the plan is good. You get buy-in, you have meetings, you have staff meetings, you buy into the plan, with the board, with the practice group, with, with the, the, the medical group, and then you circulate it and, and you act. Everybody has to know where they're going. And just again, something with you uh, seem said, hire the best, hire the best. You can't do it alone, you gotta hire the best. I remember, I remember uh, one of my early bosses said to me once, he said, Mike, this is probably something worth remembering. First class people hire first class people. Second class people hire third class people. I see it all the time. Hey Mike, I want to bring this guy in, he's going to report to me. I'm like, wait a minute, why? They're threatened. They don't want somebody to come in and show them up. That's not good leadership. You should try to hire somebody smarter than you are. In my case, that's easy. Hire somebody, surround yourself with people that are better than you. First class people hire first class people. Second class people hire third class. Now with respect to taking a page out of my brother's book, he's gonna talk about integrity and principle. John and I went to uh, Columbia and it was required, you know, we're, I was a dumb jock, he's a brilliant jock, but uh, required reading, he had to read all the great works of art and humanities and I remember in The Prince, Nikolai, Machiavelli said, to be a great leader, you must be a great liar. A deceitful man will always find plenty who are ready to be deceived. That's what Machiavelli said over 400 years ago. But what's Dwight Eisenhower say? Dwight Eisenhower said, the supreme quality for leadership is unquestionably integrity. Without it, no real success is possible. So, I'm obviously in the Eisenhower camp. I think Machiavelli was speaking at a time where you know, dictators had to be ruthless. And remember he also said, if you have to choose between being loved and feared, it's better to be feared. It doesn't work. It doesn't work because it's not the right thing to do. And it doesn't work in practicality. People like to follow people of integrity. Kevin Riley's gonna be here uh, later to talk about his experience in the NFL. And one of the great stories I, I remember is John and I played, uh, uh, back then it was Division One football, and, and we used to stay, uh, it was Columbia, but we used to win games back then, but we stayed at the same hotel as the New York Giants. Because we had uh, Friday night there, and they were there Friday night for the Sunday game, because the coach knew they were all gonna be getting drunk and screwing around, so they were in a hotel, keep them under control. And I got to know Larry Zonka, because he, he stayed down the hall from me. And one of the stories I remember from Larry Sanko was he said, uh, we were at a, a, a away game and we used the same locker room as the other team. And one of the players in the other team left the playbook in the locker room. So one of the players picked it up and brought it to Coach Shula and said, Coach, I got the playbook for the other side. Look at this. Isn't this great? We're going to win the game. Shula said, give me that. He said, burn it. I don't want to look at it. And Larry Zonka had chills telling that story to me. And I got chills hearing it. I said, wow. Is it any coincidence Don Shula was a great coach? Right? And you don't think that impressed Larry Zonka when he saw that? He said, this is a guy that I'm going to follow. This is a man of integrity. Look at this. He doesn't 
want to win the wrong way. He wants to win the right way. That inspires, and that inspires me. Doesn't it inspire you to hear a story like that? Would you follow Don Shula? Damn right you would. I would. Integrity. And by the way, it's the only way to live. You're an example when you're a leader. People are looking at you, looking at your every move. They're looking at your every move. And you know, I have a rule that and my wife loves to hear. I don't have dinner or lunch with, with a woman unless there's a third person there. I don't want people to talk about me and say, oh, look at Mike. You know, he's out there doing this. You gotta watch what you drink, because well, let's face it, all the dumb things I did in my life, I did when I was drinking. They're watching every move you make. You gotta have integrity, and they gotta sense it. Well, they won't follow you. I uh, just sum up a couple things. Uh, it's all about the team. And again, the team has to know what the plan is, and <laughs> my brother inspires me to humor. You know, when I talk about the plan, you circulate it. I, even uh, people in the audience who are Trump supporters, I think you'll agree with me that when they ask President Trump about his plan uh, on foreign policy, and he says, it's going to be so good, it's going to be great. It's just the best plan in the world. It's great. It's great. Well, how about your plan for um, uh, Obamacare? It's going to be so good. It's just going to be great. It's just the greatest plan in the world. Great, great. We're going to win. We're going to win so much you can be tired. That's not leadership. You got to get specifics, but you also have to get the team to buy in, and you got to get the team to put the team first. Football. Who said this? Individual commitment to a group effort. That is what makes a team work, a company work, a society work, a civilization work. People who work together will win whether it will be against complex football defenses or the problems of modern society. That was St. Vincent Lombardi. Individual commitment to a group effort. And yeah, I can't get enough of Lombardi. You know, Vince Lombardi never played basketball in his whole life, right? Took over a high school team, the next year, state champ. He studied, he read about basketball, he knew how to motivate, he knew how to put the team first. So if you're a leader, and people said that you're putting yourself first. I, I've appointed people in positions of power, and, and sometimes they've used those positions for self-gain. Well, I'm a practice leader. Give me the business. Guess what? Out of there. Individual commitment to the team. Team. If people sense self-interest, you don't get their respect. It's gotta be about the team. And the qualities that let me sum up with talking about some qualities just to touch upon and amplify what Mr. Yassim said. Sun Tzu, if you haven't read The Art of War, you should, everybody should, should read it, because there's some nuggets in there. The commander stands for the virtues of wisdom, gotta know what you're doing, sincerity, benevolence, courage, and strictness. So leaders have to be wise, sincere, benevolent, courage, and strictness. You gotta be even-handed, you can't play favorites, you gotta be sincere, you can't lie, you gotta have courage. Don't you love leaders who are, who are courageous, or courageous, or fearless, and strict? Kind of like being a parent, right? Who's, many of us are parents out there. You gotta be benevolent, you gotta love them, but you gotta enforce the rules, right? If you don't enforce the rules, you're not a leader, you're just like a friend. You gotta enforce the rules, you gotta enforce them unilaterally. Be decisive, goes without saying. If you don't decide, you're not deciding at all. Lead by example. Again, they're looking at you at every moment. Whenever uh, my predecessor, chairman, God rest his soul, good man, but one time I was at a meeting because I was on the board of directors before I was chairman, and we came to a disagreement, and they said, oh, he said, we're doing this. And I said, why? And he said, because I said so. And even back then, immature Mike, still immature, I said, mm, wait a minute, that doesn't, that doesn't do it for me. If you're a leader and you say, do it because I said so, you're not leading. You're not leading. You gotta get people reasons. You gotta under, have them understand. And they're looking at you at all times. If you want them to 
be honest. You gotta be honest. If you want them to work hard, you gotta work hard. If you want them to give back to the community, you gotta give back to the community because they're looking at you. Mike showed a slide to General Marshall. He said, I can't expect loyalty from my army if I don't give it. Empower people. People fail if they do it all alone. They fail. Can't do it alone. Empower people. But what's the corollary to empowerment? Accountability. All right, Glenn Callahan, one of my partners. John Mackley's another one of my partners. All right, you're in charge of this. You're in charge of Guess what? If you don't do it, we're going to have a little talk. And we're going to figure out why you're not doing it. If I'm going to empower you, you're going to be accountable. I can't say, hey, you're in charge, and I just go away and play golf for two weeks. Empower, delegate, but hold them accountable. Two other things. Be first class. Be first class. Why do it? I mean, what if I said, hey, uh, client, hire us because we're the JV. Hey, hire us because we're the second. No. I'm honest. There's certain things my firm uh, can't do that other junior varsity firms can do better. <laughs> but there's certain things we can do better than anybody. And I'm going to look them in the eye and say, we'll do that better than anybody. The quality of a person's life is in direct proportion to their commitment to excellence, regardless of their chosen field of endeavor. The quality of your life is in proportion to your commitment to excellence. Vince Lombardi, be excellent in what you do. Lead them to excellence in everything. That's one of your goals and your plan. Finally, I teach at UVA Law School, and my good friend Mark Rathen's here, and he knows what I'm about to say. And it's about passion and risk taking. And Socrates said, if you want to be a good leader and you want to persuade, there's three things you have to do. And I teach my students this. Three qualities of argument. Ethos, you gotta have credibility. I'm 60 and I hope I've got that by now. Logos, you gotta know what you're talking about, right? And last but not least, pathos. Not only your passion, but you gotta invoke the passion of the people you're speaking to. You gotta do that to persuade. Don't forget that passion, that pathos. Find out what drives them. Try, find out what motivates them and be passionate. Not only your presentation, but be passionate about evoking that from them. I do that in front of juries all the time. You should do that as a leader. Be passionate and take risks. Forte Fortuna you want. Fortune does favor the brave. And don't forget what Scott Gretzky said. You're going to miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Right, Glenn Callahan? Scott Gretzky, the great Gretzky. Let me conclude by saying that I am passionate about my firm, passionate about my friends and family, passionate about giving back to my community, and I am passionate about the Hospital University of Pennsylvania. It saved the lives of many people in my family, I'm entrusting my life in the Hospital University of Pennsylvania next week. Very passionate about Hop, Hop Rocks. And they lead. And I'm honored and humbled to be part of this group. Thank you very much. how he's really founded the field of oculoplastics, how he has done the first bilateral hand transplant. Those are great things, but who Scott Levin is, is a man of integrity, a man of distinct honesty, and uh, maybe the most loyal person I've ever met in my life. So he's going to talk this morning uh, about what it is to be a servant leader, and that's what he has become for us in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. Scott, thanks for coming this morning. I've given leadership talks before, uh, 
those of the residents who are in my office see my credenza filled with books on leadership, Colin Powell, all the books written by Jim Collins, Good to Great, you know, who's a level five leader. Uh, the faculty, unbelievable here, my good friend Larry Kaiser, who uh, not only leads in Philadelphia, pales in comparison to his stature in American surgery, American thoracic surgery. Where's Mike? Mike, I am, I am really humbled. That's all I can tell you, because you and John, your mom and dad, your dad was in the Marines, my dad was a Naval career officer, inculcated in both of you the principles that undermines this, this conference this morning. And so I would never want to be an attorney on the opposite side of Mike Kelly with that kind of passion and directness, look people in the eye. And, uh, you know, I'm going to put th through a few slides here uh, this is an article I wrote, who cares? Uh, but leadership in an institution, uh, that's, that's really what I can talk about. Uh, you know, we're the product of our parents, we're the product of our mentors, uh, either as a fellow or as a resident or a medical student. Uh, and, and that's sort of what creates us. Uh, we, we have challenges in academic medicine have challenges in our institution. We actually have challenges in Penn Orthopedics. I wake up in the morning, I say, how can we do things better? The residents know I meet with the classes every year. I don't, I don't ask what's right. I ask what's wrong. I just had a meeting at 6 o'clock yesterday morning. There were concrete things. The, uh, looking at Lopez up there. The, the, the resident office on the fifth floor of PPMC is a closet. It's inadequate. So what did I do after a case yesterday? I went up with the residents and looked at it. Can I make a difference? I don't know, but I'm going to try. Here's Ben Franklin, you know, an unbelievable leader, started Pennsylvania Hospital. And, you know, this is uh, my perspective as a department chair. Accountability, Mike mentioned. Encourage and motivate. That's what a leader does. Look at you all right here. Dan, I may need some help here. So, in academic medicine, here are three missions. Research, education, clinical care. Uh, you have a lot of responsibilities. This is to the residents when you go through a pro program. But one of the principles, right, is not only scholarly work, which comes third, patient care comes first. But what do I ask each resident July 1st? I ask them to lead. I ask them to teach. If you're a PGY1, you have nursing students, you have medical students, you're leading. People are looking at you. The PGY5s have to translate their knowledge, their experience, their judgment to those below them. Uh, late at night, PGY1 calls, I'm having a problem. I expect the response of the senior residents to say, uh, read the book, uh, figure it out. No, I expect that resident to say, I'll, I'll be there. I'm coming to help. That's that's the leader. Uh, this was my dad, Mike, uh, naval career officer, uh, was buried at Arlington, uh, and he he shaped me, he defined me. He was a servant leader. He was uh, started after his career in the Navy, uh, went on the accelerated plan to Yale, got a job. Mike, I'm looking right at you. Got a job in a scrap metal plant uh, in South Philly started literally sorting scrap on his hands and knees after being a captain on a minesweeper, went to Yale, and worked his way up to be president of the company. Uh, was the first person in the office like you most probably, uh, and the last person to leave. Uh, he was passionate. I remember in the winter, he uh, ran a foundry. See? So he would get up early in the morning, he'd get donuts and coffee, Foundry was freezing cold, had a lot of immigrant workers there who were of Polish descent, and he'd, he'd bring them food on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, he didn't have to do that. He could have delegated that. Uh, but one of the things that I think is so effective, and I'm interested in Larry's perspective on this, uh, what, do, what do strong generals do, Marlene, uh, leaders in the Navy? They're not in the war room 
behind the battle. They're in the front. So as an example of what I thought was important in leadership, when I came to Penn eight years ago, <coughs> no one knew me. No one knew what I was about, good, bad, or indifferent. I made sure that I operated and saw clinics in every entity of our health system so that the person who's on the front knows that somebody in command is, is there. That's what my dad taught me. This was Dave Zabiston skipping from my dad to uh, the people that influenced me the most, and everybody's heard me talk about Dave Sabiston. And what did, what did Dr. Sabiston instill in me? What did he say was the most important thing? John, William Osler passed through these halls as chair of medicine. And if you read the writings of Osler, Osler was brilliant. Larry, over a thousand autopsies here, I think, in terms of his history. What defined and uh, Saviston used to quote Osler of success as a physician. What defines success? Two words. I'll never forget Dr. Saviston talking to me about this the first morning of orientation of our internship. That it's not how smart you are. It's not knowing all the facts necessarily. The Kellys talked about principle and passion, all that. But two words define success. Those two words are hard work, hard work. And I don't think I'm the sharpest tack in the box, but for better or worse, leaders don't compete with others, but they work hard. You know, and I tell the residents when they apply to our program, pan orthopedics is not for everyone. Because if you don't have a strong work ethic, you don't need to be here. We know that there are other programs. I just visited one in New York City who's listed number one last week. Won't remain nameless. I was visiting a professor there. Uh, there's no uh, trauma unit. There's no being called in the middle of the night to see a sick patient or a patient that's having trouble breathing. Uh, there are a lot of things that aren't. Uh, is that the kind of residency I want to have my doctor go for? No. Because when I'm having trouble at 3 in the morning, what do I expect? I expect the person that operated on me, number one, to be aware, and number two, at some point, to be at the bedside. So those are old timey principles, and in the constraints of the 80-hour week, that's uh, sometimes hard. It's Leonard Gomer, who served on a Navy destroyer, uh, my teacher. First one in in the morning, last one to leave. What's another principle of the servant leader? No matter how busy he was, how many patients he'd seen, somebody would call him up, previous resident, <coughs> current resident, somebody in practice for a number of years and say, Dr. Goldner, my wife's leaving me. I just got sued. I have a sick child who's having trouble. And Len Goldner, Lord rest his soul, would always make time. He could have 100 patients in clinic, then, you know, I'll see you. And he might see that person at 10 o'clock at night. Or he'd say, I'll see you at 5.30 tomorrow morning in my office. And he would be there. So that's the servant leader. Uh, Jim Urbanik, still living, known to the orthopedic surgeon, my mentor, that played uh, football, Mike, for Bear Bryant. Played football for Bear Bryant. And Bryant was in Kentucky. Uh, son of uh, coal miners the work ethic and so forth, rose to the greatest heights. So, you know, I could go on and on about leaders. This is Jim Collins, getting the right people on the bus. Most important asset in an organization, Mike, you seem said it, not people, the right people. So we started with 16 or 17 faculty, John, right in 2009, we're over 40. Each person is handpicked, and I absolutely believe in the <coughs> Mike Kelly mantra, for Michael, that's from Malcolm Forbes, I think. You hire people better than yourself. Absolutely. When I give talks to academic groups, yeah, what was it, Mike? First class people hire people better than themselves. First class hire first class, second class hire third class. Exactly. Uh, I don't want that person to come see because they're going to eat into my billable hours. They're going to take away my cases. I don't want another shoulder or hip or knee surgeon or thoracic surgeon because they're going to cut into my practice. Larry, when have we ever seen that? All 
votes are risen if you hire talented people. Uh, level five leader is what I try to be. I'm far from it, but I tell the residents, read about Jim Collins, the person nobody hears about. You know, who's the president of Intel today? I don't know, but it's an amazing company. Jack Welsh, here are all the people I read about. Rudy Giuliani in 9-11. Controversial, yes, Republican, outspoken. But what did he do when New York was suffering? He, he led admirably uh, and held people accountable. Sandy Weil, who my brother worked for, unbelievable story. Uh, Mike Krzyzewski is somebody I know. Let me just digress one second. John, if I'm running over time, which I think I am, I'll stop. How this came about was uh, the Vegan Leadership Program at Duke. <coughs> the worst thing I could have done at Penn, and I didn't do it, when, when Larry came from UCLA here and so forth, you never say at Duke we did this. We're not at Duke anymore, we're at Penn, right? Although you call on life lessons, you call on experiences or cultural things that if they're not in an institution as a leader, it's your responsibility to bring it. Mike, how many attorneys have you hired that actually have brought something maybe into the firm? Different way of doing things and so forth. So one of the things that I learned uh, from Krzyzewski that's really important about leadership <coughs> and his family, and of course he's won the Olympics, he <coughs> quote the book, The Gold Standard, how he got LeBron and Dwayne Wade and Kobe to finally play together as a team. So the book, The Five Point Play, Gold Standard Leading with Mark, is that honesty is important, communication is important. Uh, when you lead, when you lead, as has been said, it's not about you, it's about your team. And when I send an email, I address it to the, to the residents and faculty, not because it's my idea, I address it as team. Here's the issue, team. Not you do this, or dear Joe. When it's collective, it's a team. As long as people function as a team, they can win games. Now, Krzyzewski also said, the most, when you read the book, the most important team you ever play on, the most important team you ever play on is your family. And I think I tell the residents that one of the liabilities of work ethic, passion, commitment to profession, and everybody knows about the term life, work-life balance. I don't know what that is. That's a fault. I have a flaw. We asked my wife, my second wife, she'll tell you. <laughs> I lost my first wife because of uh, having a mistress. Who was my mistress? My mistress was Duke Hospital and the lessons of Dave Saxton. Am I bitter? No. Am I proud of my history? Yes, because I faced adversity and came through it. I don't need a medal, but this morning and in terms of leading, lead your family first. If I leave you with one idea, lead your family first. And I think, I think everything else will follow. Here, case principles, gold standard, love Lombardi. Listen to this. We'd accomplish many more things if we did not think of them as impossible. When I came to Penn, Penn is a great institution. 250 year history, leaders of Penn here in the room, they'll, they'll never succeed. One of my faculty, co-faculty members at Duke said when they found out I took the job, they said, they're going to hate you there. That's a nice thing to say. They're going to hate you there. And I took that as a challenge. And here I am. I'm still standing. We have an acceptable uh, orthopedic program. I'd say more than acceptable. But humility is important in leadership. Can we always get better? <coughs> you bet. You bet. And so uh, I'll close by saying, you know, when I heard uh, about a lecture that took place at the Fuqua School of Business, the president of Coca-Cola gave a talk to the business students. And uh, he finished his talk, and then he said, are there any questions? And somebody raised their hand, they said to him, uh, I can't remember his name, uh, Dr. Mr. Mr. Smith, let's just say, what motivates you when you come to work as a leader? What motivates you? And his answer was three and a half billion thirsty people. And what motivates me when I come to work in the morning is to advance the academic mission, to train the next generation, 
and personally trying to get better at the care I give my patients on a day-to-day -day basis. That's what guys me. But the servant leader is, again, putting, you've heard it from Mike, you've heard it from Mike, you've seen, uh, you know, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King, putting others first. And nobody gets to where they get to. <coughs> and I think it's, it's saying hello to the, the custodian who empties your garbage in your office or to the person who's mopping the floor in the operating room. Those are the people that count uh, that can make a difference uh, for the team. So John, I'm going to stop right now. I have many more slides, but a lot's been said. And I have to tell you, John, incredible credit goes to you for inspiring us to do this. And the story, and I'll just finish with the story of John Fagan. John Fagan uh, was Norman Schwarzkopf's uh, physician, Storm and Norman. And I had the privilege of meeting uh, Norman Schwarzkopf when he had his shoulder replaced. Uh, Fagan also uh, took care of uh, Mike Krzyzewski when he was at West Point. Krzyzewski played for uh, uh, Bobby, Bobby Knight uh, in the Army. And being around these kind of people, uh, John Fagan started the leadership program at Duke, Coach K, you know, leadership program at Fuqua School of Business. And I actually, uh, when I was uh, leading a plastic surgery, surgery organization, had a uh, sort of a business for academic leaders in plastic surgery at Duke about nine years ago, eight years ago, just when I came to uh, him. And I asked Mike Krzyzewski to talk. And um, we had our program uh, on Saturday and Sunday. And Krzyzewski arrived at 2.30 in the morning from a game against Boston College. And sure enough, at 8.30, he was standing there with a suit on and gave a talk about leadership and talk about the servant leader, you know, he really inspired me. So the lessons of the military, these figures who are great, uh, highly profiled, but yet as individuals, <coughs> walk, walk, and talk, talk. Uh, the Fagan program, uh, as a matter of fact, Scott Tozen, who helped on the uh, hand transplant, and my PA are going down there to talk about the uh, teamwork for the hand transplant program. I can't, I can't go, but I'm sending my teammates uh, to this forum that's going to actually be this next uh, weekend. So we have now, thanks to the people in this room, not only the residents and the trainees, but the faculty, Mike, you, Larry, others, we have the equivalent of the Fagan program here, but I think we're going to try to make it better. I am competitive. Uh, but that's the story, that's the story of how we sort of came here today. And I think that every person in this room, including myself, most importantly myself, should be thinking about Every day, how do I get better as a leader? And do I have faults? You bet. Residents are up there laughing. They probably can list 50 of them. Uh, but don't think that I don't. They're smiling, but it's probably true. Uh, I care about you. Uh, I care about our program. And I care about when we graduate board eligible orthopedic surgeons done, we're also going to be graduating good leaders. So thanks very much. Mike Sherry, the Ill Illness, was the first person I called because he's in the Fox supplements, L. Scott Levin. Uh, I am uh, just so overwhelmed that uh, Larry Kaiser agreed to speak this morning. Uh, Dr. Kaiser is an uh, icon in general surgery. He is uh, at Temple, where I spent many good years. He's the Lewis Katz Dean of the School of Medicine and the Executive Vice President of Health Affairs, and the President and CEO, in addition to being Professor of Thoracic Surgery. This is a person who has time-tested as a leader, as well as accomplished much. Uh, he was a Professor of Surgery at Penn here for many years. In 96, he was named the Elbridge Elias Professor of Surgery, the first individual to hold that, that position. In 2001, following into the search, he was named the John Rhea Bart Professor of Chairman of the Department of Surgery, he also serves the University Health System Surgeon in Chief. So I don't need to go any further to know that this is a proven leader. And I'm just so uh, excited to hear what Dr. Kyers is going to tell the audience about how to make decisions, how to be decisive, and get from point A to point B. Larry, thanks for blessing us with your questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it really is a 
uh, honored to be on the program this morning. Uh, it's always tough to follow Mike Yassim, I must say. Uh, my son is graduating uh, from the Wharton School tomorrow, actually, uh, with his MBA, and uh, everybody at Wharton is outstanding. And Mike, uh, you know, it's just too bad he didn't have more time, but he truly is outstanding. Let me start off by saying leadership is uh, contextual. Uh, much of what we do as leaders uh, is based on context. And, uh, you know, my portrait is on the wall over there with the rest of the several other chairs of surgery. Elder July sat up there at the top, and uh, Rabden uh, after him, Leonard Miller, uh, Billy Fitz, uh, Clyde Barker, my predecessor. Uh, but the difference between me and the rest of them is I'm actually in scrubs because uh, I actually am an operating surgeon and I still operate. Uh, and when I was here, I had a, a hugely busy, busy surgical practice, and um, which I think is important. Um, for a surgeon as a leader. But you'll see when I finish this talk why uh, surgeons, in fact, are great leaders. Uh, if uh, the residents haven't seen this book that Melina Kibbe and Herb Chen edited, um, I commend this to you because I think it has a number of things in there that are important. Um, you know, my chapter on conflict resolution obviously is the best chapter. <laughs> There's actually, uh, th this book is in incredibly well put together and I think it's, uh, it's something that many of you should uh, avail yourself of. So, we can talk a lot about the, health, about the changing healthcare environment because there is a lot going on right now in case you haven't, many, many of the residents are probably so busy in your program, Scott, they haven't heard of some of the things going on in Washington. But I assure you that there's a lot changing uh, in healthcare and especially how healthcare is paid for. Uh, Aetna has uh, just pulled out of the exchange business uh, completely. You have a number of areas in the country where uh, there's only one product offered on the exchange or only one company offering products on the exchange. Uh, those companies uh, in several states now who put in their uh, recommendations uh, for premiums this coming year, averaging over 30% increase, some as much as 60% increase, so needless to say, a lot is changing. I think the big question you need to ask uh, of yourself, especially if you're in a role, in a leadership role, is why should anyone be led by you? You know, and for that matter, what's different about you that equips you to leave, or alternatively, what's special about you that others should want to follow you? These are questions you should be asking yourself every day. Clearly, this whole concept of leading yourself is particularly important, and I would sum all this up by saying, and really until you know yourself, it's very difficult to, uh, to be a leader. I give a talk uh, at the American College of Surgeons, uh, the Surgeons as Leaders course, called Leading Yourself, which I think is particularly important. There have been a whole lot of studies done over the past number of years uh, looking at uh, trying to determine the definitive styles, characteristics, or personality traits of great leaders. Look at this, over a thousand studies. And still there's no clear profile of an ideal leader. But the most important capability for leaders to develop is the, this concept of self-awareness. You have to know yourself. I think one of the most important concepts uh, that some people find difficult to, uh, to learn is there are lots of people who want to be in these jobs. There are not a lot of people who want to do these jobs. And there's a huge difference between wanting to be in one of these positions and wanting to actually do the job. That's where the self-awareness piece comes in. You have to know yourself. People who failed in leadership roles, usually it's because they wanted to be there but really didn't want to do it and they really didn't understand in themselves what it is that they truly wanted to do. And I can tell you all sorts of stories about people who come to me wanting to be something, or when I was chair here, having one of my division chiefs say, here, I've been offered a chairman's job at X place, and I think I should take it, and uh, it was clear they wanted to be it, but they really didn't want to do it. Knowing your authentic self requires courage and honesty to open up and examine one's own experiences, and I think that's an absolutely critical concept. John Maxwell, who's written a whole lot about leadership, said people buy into the leader before they buy into the vision. Not to diminish the concept of vision, but people buy into the leader actually before they buy into the concept. Uh, Scott mentioned uh, Schwarzkopf. Leadership is a combination of strategy and character. If you must be without one, be without the strategy. Huge differences between a boss and a leader. We could go over it, but you could read them. Bosses drive employees. Leaders coaches them. Leaders coach them. A boss depends on authority. A leader on goodwill. A boss inspires fear. A leader generates enthusiasm. A boss says I. A leader says we. And you heard a lot about that this morning, too. This is a team effort. All leadership is a team effort. It's great that Bob Iger uh, leads uh, to Walt Disney Corporation. More importantly, he's married to Willow Bay. 
If anybody's ever seen a picture of Willow Bay, you know what I'm talking about. She actually has just become the dean of the Annenberg School at USC also, so. Uh, a, a boss places blame for the breakdown, a leader fixes the breakdown, etc. Move along here. A few facts about leadership. It isn't for everyone. And there is no formula or direct path to a leadership position. I get asked all the time, I want to do what you do. Well, there is no direct path to this. There is a significant difference, as I said, between wanting to be and really wanting to do, and I think that's a key. Having a business degree does not guarantee a leadership position. I can uh, cite you uh, any number of physicians who've gone on to get their MBA, MBA thinking it's going to propel them to a leadership position. It is no guarantee. Uh, these are not great jobs if you desire to be loved by all. Anybody in a position of leadership, uh, if you have this tremendous desire to be loved, these are not great jobs. No matter uh, what decision I make, somebody's going to be unhappy. Somebody's going to be unhappy. You must be prepared if you're willing to take a leadership position to put your own interest secondary to the interest of the rest of the entity, and that's a key. If you are not prepared to put your own interest secondary to the interest of the entity or people that you lead, you will fail. But they're not great jobs. You want to be loved by all, as others have said. You know, if you want to be loved, get a dog. I have three. <laughs> <laughs> These are just two of the three. <laughs> The key to being a good leader is keeping people who hate you away from those who are still undecided. <laughs> now this is absolutely key. <laughs> Probably most of the residents don't know who Casey Stengel was, but whatever. Nothing truer has ever been said. Margaret Thatcher said, being powerful is like being a lady. If you have to tell people you are, you aren't. <laughs> Leaders at the top know the, this is a key concept as well. You know, when you're in a position of leadership, people tend to only tell you what, uh, what they think you want to hear and try to sanitize the information and not tell you the bad stuff. I admire Scott who asks the residents, what are we doing wrong? That's not something people want to come and tell somebody in a position of leadership. And I think leaders have to know, people only tell you what you want to hear. And I think it's incumbent on a leader to create an environment where people are comfortable in telling you things that you may not want to hear. But I'd rather know it up front than find out later. I'd rather know it up front than read it in the newspaper, for that matter. But that's a very important concept, and people in a position of leadership have to understand that. When placed in command, take charge. Leadership cannot really be taught. It can only be learned. Now, there's some dispute, as Mike pointed out. But it certainly can be learned, whether you can teach it. Uh, and Dwight Eisenhower, who was quoted earlier, said, leadership is the art of getting someone else to do something you want done because he wants to do it. Also a key. Why should surgeons be in leadership positions? I think there are a number of reasons why surgeons make great leaders. Number one, simply putting together a team and taking them to the operating room, taking a patient to the operating room is an example of leadership that all of you exemplify every day. That is leadership. We're decisive. We have the ability to make decisions quickly based on the available information. That's what defines us. That's what being a surgeon is all about. We are. We like to take charge, and uh, those who like to take charge are attracted to surgery, at least some of the surgical specialties. I can't say that about all the surgical specialties, but most of them. And, you know, surgeons lead every day, just as I pointed out. Surgeons, we have a healthy fear of failure. We know how to manage it, but we do everything to avoid it. There's absolutely no question about that. We are familiar with working as part of a team and delegating responsibility. We know how to recognize talent. We know how to manage stress and get out of trouble. We're comfortable with the concept of accountability. We are comfortable with the concept of accountability. Surgeons, step forward, not back. We, we are comfortable with that. In our Morbidity and Mortality Conference, we are comfortable with taking accountability. We don't make excuses. And clearly, we have the ability to learn from our failures, as is pointed out to us in our morbidity and mortality conference. And we also have the ability to mobilize and motivate others. This slide, you won't be able to read the names, but these are surgeons who are in positions of leadership today, not department chairs. We assume that. But these are surgeons who are in positions of leadership in major organizations. Toby Cosgrove at the Cleveland Clinic has just announced he's stepping down. Dave Torciano, my friend, who cardiac surgeon who now leads Partners Healthcare in Boston, a $12, $13 billion organization. And the list goes on. There are no universal characteristics uh, for leadership. What works for one leader will not work for another. There's only one Jack Welsh. Anybody who tries to be him ain't going to do it. Those aspiring to leadership need to discover what it is about themselves that they can mobilize in a leadership context. You need to deploy your own leadership assets at first identifying them. And again, you have to be at a stage where you're willing to put the aims of others in front of your own. 
a friend of mine came to me, was offered a chair um, at another university. The first question I said to him was, are you willing to put your research interest, he was very into uh, ECMO, uh, doing some really cutting edge work, are you willing to put that aside to lead this organization? Fortunately, he was, and he's done a great job. Mimicking what worked for others is not the path to becoming a great leader. I mentioned Welsh, the challenge to become more knowing and more skilled at disclosing yourself rather than trying to become someone else. Clearly important. What do followers want from leaders? They want a feeling of excitement and personal significance. They want to feel, some, feel that they are part of something bigger, a community. I think Scott has done that so incredibly well here in establishing this great department. And for those of you who, who are not aware, this was an department that had some troubles. When I was chair here, this department was in some trouble, and clearly one of the great departments today. But the most important quality is authenticity. Effective leaders were able to communicate a consistent sense of self that's invested skillfully in each of the roles that they play. This concept of authenticity is critical for leaders. A number of behaviors of strong personal leadership that have been articulated by Evelyn, self-reflection, self-awareness, self-care, continuous learning, listening, we can spend the day on these things. Stick through that. This concept of emotional intelligence was mentioned earlier, and I think it's a key one. It's a key differentiator between good and great performers. That is the strength in social and emotional competencies. What is emotional intelligence we talk about? It? It's the ability to perceive, understand, and manage the emotions of oneself and those of others with whom we have interpersonal relations. Daniel Goldman's gotten a lot of credit for this for this concept of emotional intelligence because he really has been the one that's operationalized it. But the concept, interestingly, was, was initially described by Peter Salovey, the current president of Yale, a psychologist who really was the one who did more than anything else to, to articulate this particular concept. Goldman has operationalized it and I think done extremely well. What are the five components that underlie emotional intelligence? Self-awareness, we get right back to self-awareness, self-regulation and ability to control one's emotions and impulsive actions. Not easy sometimes for many surgeons, in fact. <laughs> Motivation, a passion driving one's desire to pursue goals that go beyond money or status. Empathy, empathy, something that we physicians, if we haven't already developed, we clearly need to develop, but it is the ability to understand and respond according to the emotional reactions of others. And then this whole concept of social skills, managing relationships and building 195 global leaders asked to rate 74 qualities that rose to the top. Summarized by strong ethics and safety, self-organizing, efficient learning, nurturing growth and connection and belonging. 67% set high ethical and moral standards. If you want to lead, you need to have established your credibility and have these high ethical and moral standards. That's what people want to follow. That actually is not me, but the resemblance is somewhat startling. I should be doing ads, you know? I mean, uh, when this came up in some magazine, I absolutely did a double take. Mike Yassim wrote this book called The Leader's uh, Checklist. Uh, I would uh, recommend it to all of you, and uh, he talked a little bit about it, but, you know, Mike leads the leadership program at Wharton, and he is one of the leadership gurus in the country, and this is a very short book but it tells you a lot that you need to know. Why should anyone be led by you? Effective leaders must answer this question every day and all they say and do. Effective leaders speak the truth. They don't use their words to hurt the feelings of others. Effective leaders care about others. They put their own needs before the needs of others, as we've talked about. They have a rich moral fiber. They don't treat others as inferior. They build teams and create communities. And so much about this leadership is about building teams. It's very interesting to be the leader who can take the credit for what all these others are doing to make us look good, but it's about building teams. They don't work independently of others. They focus on results and are mission-driven. They don't put their own self-interest ahead of the goals of the organization. They own up to their mistakes, this concept of accountability, and they don't use defensive strategies to protect their ego. My own leadership principles, I don't take anything personally. There's always gonna be people who disagree. I encourage contrar contrarian views and thinking. I want people to tell me that, what I'm what, that I'm dead wrong about what I just said, or that we can't do that, you're going to kill this place. Surround yourself with talented, ambitious people that has been talked about this morning. That's one of the keys. Leaders fail when they surround themselves with sycophants, Mr. Trump. <laughs> <coughs> Surround yourself with talented, ambitious people. Talented people need to be given, and this is key, 
You want to have talented people, give them the responsibility, but also give them the authority. You cannot keep talented people if you get the response, if you have responsibility, but not the authority. One of the problems with many dean's jobs around the country is lots of responsibility, very little authority. The authority comes with the money, which is on the health system side. Never be afraid to change course or reverse a decision. I have no problem recognizing that the course that we've set out is not the right one. And, and, and Penn is a great example. Uh, Bill Kelly, who recruited me uh, here uh, in 1991, was a spectacular leader and a great builder of departments. And the people he recruited, you could go from till tomorrow. Francis Collins at the NIH, who leads the NIH, a Bill Kelly uh, trainee. Peter Traber, who led this Department of Medicine, a Bill Kelly trainee. There are many, many of them. But Bill set out a course for Penn Medicine at the time um, that turned out not to be the right course and racked up $800 million worth of debt for the health system. The, many of you don't, uh, don't realize that in the late 90s, the university actually tried to sell the health system. Uh, Vanguard came in and was about to buy it. Fortunately, the people of CHOP stood up, as well as a number of the department chairs. But the university wanted to unload this thing. $800 million worth of debt bill racked up. Never be afraid to change course. The other thing is, for leaders, show up. People want to see you. Listen aggressively, and then the most importantly, communicate, communicate, and communicate some more critically important. Uh, for the residents, what should you be doing now? Get on some committees, and the junior faculty as well. <coughs> Recognize who the search firms are out there. Network, go to national meetings. Uh, you know, this is, uh, that's what these meetings are for. In the current uh, information age, I'm not sure that there's any great role for some of our national organizations anymore other than networking. I'm not sure people standing up and talking at these large group meetings is all that important anymore, but networking is important. The concept of mentoring, particularly important, identify a mentor, and then this self-assessment is critical. Self-assess constantly. Takeaway messages. Surgeons possess many qualities that make them ideal change agents. We are decision makers, risk takers, activists. We have leadership skills, which we demonstrate every day. We have a healthy fear of failure, and we take accountability. In the current era, David Skinner, in a 1981 address to the American Association for Thoracic Surgery, said, surgeons need to become surgeons, obviously, but something more. We are leaders in patient safety and quality, and remember, who put together the MSQIP, uh, the uh, American College of Surgeons, uh, put that out there, but surgeons have been responsible for talking about patient safety and quality, and we know how to efficiently use resources. And I would encourage all of you, if the opportunity arises, and after a period of frank self-assessment, become part of the, the decision-making process. Step up, get out of your comfort zone. That's all I have, thank you. here, and then I want you to stay for our case presentation. I'm going to ask our speakers this morning. We have a couple vignettes and what I'm going to call leadership moments, how you to handle the situation. But first, I'm going to get my good friend Jim Gallo. Let me tell you about Jimmy Gallo. Jimmy comes from the heartland of Southwest Philadelphia. He was a tough Irish kid growing up in St. Callistus Parish where, he, where people rule with their fists. And uh, toughness was here the other day. Jimmy was started out in the postal service as a mail carrier and instead of the postmaster without a college degree, which he subsequently attained. So he's doing something right. He single-handedly had the post office and 4,000 employees with a budget of $300 million. The reason I asked Jimmy Gallo to speak this morning is because he brings to this forum, I think I'm what I call street smarts. Jimmy knows how to get things done. And Jim's going to share with us some of the vignettes he's learned as eight years as postmaster of Philadelphia. Jimmy, thank you for being here this morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, my friend John Kelly asked me to do this a few months ago, and uh, uh, this week I gave some real serious thought uh, about the audience uh, to prepare for this. Uh, today you heard a little bit about culture, vision, integrity, uh, organizing, and executing. Like John said, I started 
uh, with a company, the United States Postal Service, uh, literally the day after I graduated high school. Uh, being from uh, West Philadelphia, uh, my mother went to ninth grade at Mass Bomb in the Kensington area of Philadelphia, and my father went to 10th grade at Overbrook High School. So I was the first high school graduate in the family. Uh, senior year of high school, I was uh, forced to take the test for postal service. And I went down to a room with probably about a thousand other folks, took the test. I got called in January of my senior year of high school. So I said, yeah, 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 I'll take the job, figuring I'm going to skate right past this. Uh, my father gets the mail. I have to go down. I start June 15, 1970. Started right down the street as a truck driver. Uh, delivered mail in uh, all the nice areas of Philadelphia, North Philly, South Philly, West Philly, Southwest Philly. I did that for approximately 10 years. But let me back up a little bit and talk a little bit about my role models uh, before I get into my career. My role models were my mother uh, and my father. And later in life, it was Mother Teresa. I'm glad I saw her picture up there. And the, the area that I grew up in, uh, I'll give you for instance, I had, I had 200 row houses on my street and approximately, give or take, six or 700 kids any given day out on the street. And being the oldest of four, I didn't have an older brother or anybody, like a twin. I could have used you, Mike. To cover my back. So I had to use uh, whatever skill set it took uh, to get home for dinner every night. So I was coached on uh, to go into the postal service and spent my first 10 years of carrying mail. Uh, got a little older, now I'm 28 years old, I'm thinking about getting married, I wanted to get into management. How do you get into management? I filled out some paperwork, took some tests, couldn't get anywhere, uh, went through some interviews. I uh, got shot down probably three different times because I didn't have enough experience. You know the old, you don't have enough experience, but how do you get experience if you don't uh, get experience? So it's the double-edged sword. So <clears throat> I was offered a line supervisor position down in South Philadelphia. I uh, started out with 150 employees back in 1981, I believe. And over 50% of my employees were World War II vets. Now picture an 18-year-old snot-nosed kid coming in to try to influence about 50 World War II vets to how to do the job and get out on the street and get the job done. Well, I heard today uh, the, about the art of listening. And whether I liked it or not, I had to listen to these guys. And they told me, kid, this is how we're going to do it. And this is the way we do things down here and so on. So, I got an education in itself just from those folks. And uh, as one thing led to another, I put in for every tough job. I was hungry, uh, didn't have the education background, so I had to put in for every job. So the first manager position I got was the uh, task for projects, 25th and Snyder. And uh, is anybody from Philly? Okay, so a few of you folks do know what I'm talking about. So, uh, and you know, I didn't know any difference, so I thought it was great. And uh, uh, I had to build my team, like I heard. I had probably 35, 40 uh, guys at that time. We didn't have any women out there delivering mail. And my job was to get all the mail delivered to approximately 40 houses, get everybody back safe, uh, no blood, no foul, and get everybody home for the next day. So uh, obviously, I, I guess I was doing a pretty good job. Other opportunities opened, they asked me to come uh, down to run the main office. Uh, ran the main office for a few years, and then uh, they were looking for somebody to run 30th Street, run the whole processing, kit and caboodle, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I put in for that. And uh, they did a search, they did a national search, uh, because this being a big metropolitan area, uh, they needed somebody with a uh, big city background. 
So I ended up getting that position. Uh, I was in that position for about four or five years. Now, uh, when I hear about you know talk to talk and walk to walk, I had approximately in that position alone uh, 5,000, 6,000 employees. I was visible to five to 6,000 employees uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We never shut down. So uh, you had to be visible. You had to be willing to answer questions. I'd be walking the floor. Folks would come up to me, Mr. Gallagher, what do you think about this? How do we do that? So I was getting an education in itself about people, about process, and how to educate people. So what I started to spend a lot of time is, is because I was hearing so many different questions and so many different concerns, how can we fine tune this and how can we fine tune processes? Processes about mail flows in, mail flows out, and at the same time educating everybody. How, do you, how would be the best way to educate the folks that are doing the job, but in real time? So I would work on checklists. I would work on, uh, I saw some checklists up here were, which were outstanding. But I would work on checklists within operations, you know, maybe five uh, critical points or six critical points. And every new employee would be educating on the checklist. And it's not an I gotcha, it's, it's educating folks so that they feel good about their job and they know what they have to do. So that became very successful. It was taken as a best practice throughout the country and we expanded it a little bit more uh, when I became postmaster of Philadelphia. So after, uh, I guess in 95, I went through the executive program, uh, had to go down to a DC for some training, and then I was eligible to be interviewed for different positions. I was offered positions outside of the Philadelphia area. I wasn't mobile at the time. So the postmaster of Philadelphia came up. Uh, I was interviewed for that position. I was offered the, the job, uh, which was a home run for me and my family. I never had to relocate. So with that position, I ended up having, well, probably a little bit more because I had responsibility for the process center and the retail uh, delivery and collection of all the mail in the Philadelphia metropolitan area. So I started to work with more process, more checklists, and a checklist, and educating the employees and bringing them up to the level that everybody would be eligible and qualified for promotions. And I started to recruit from within uh, and build a team. And we were really uh, very, very successful. Uh, and during my tenure, we were considered one of the best postal services in the country. Uh, we were rated and evaluated every day. Uh, every day we got a test score on the uh, uh, voice of the customer. The voice of the customer, uh, we were mandated to get 95% of every letter put in the mailbox, in 5,000 mailboxes, to your house, 95%, 96% of the time within 24 hours. Now, I don't want to hear about any of your postal problems, I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> but no, on a serious note, uh, and I used to talk to people, I would go to different parties and different functions, and, and as soon as they, they heard where I worked, they would ask me questions. Uh, like my good friend John Kelly, he likes me to tell the, the dog stories when I would be fighting dogs and getting bit by dogs in North Philly, uh, rather than my post postmaster stories. But. Uh, we ended up becoming very successful, and the thing that really uh, gave me the most pleasure was seeing people from Philadelphia get promoted in high-level positions. Uh, they were being considered for jobs outside of the city. A friend, a, a friend of mine who I mentored became the vice president of uh, delivery nationally. Uh, the, the present postmaster general, uh, Megan Brennan, uh, she worked for me, and uh, she asked me to take over after I was postmaster as the uh, regional lead executive of the Philly Metro. And she, they also, Postmaster General and Board of Governors, asked me to take over the project of moving the Philadelphia Post Office to Lindbergh and transitioning all the property over to Penn. You guys got a good deal on that, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, that, that was my, probably my last three years uh, of my career. And, uh, which people ask, how were you able to navigate? Uh, not going to college, not doing this, not doing that. And it, it really was, you know, and I, I don't want to call it street smarts as much as I had an ability to listen and be able to respect people. And, and I think that 
that goes a long way in the business world. I, I, I really do. And I had an ability to recognize the easy ways to get in trouble from my upbringing and the, uh, the folks that I saw go down the tube drill or with early in life. And, and I used to call it the three B's. Excuse me for not being politically correct, but the three B's were when, whenever we had an investigation, I, I also had the postal inspector at the inspection service under it. And whenever we had an investigation into a robbery or an assault internally, this was internal crimes. And uh, I was briefed by the inspector in charge. I would always ask the first question, what B got the defendant in trouble? And I used to call it the three Bs. So it was either betting, he was a gambler, or broads, chasing the sex game, having the girlfriend, stealing to support the girlfriend, or booze slash drugs. And inadvertently, it was always one of those three to get you in trouble. So for the young folks and the, and the older folks, uh, that will sneak up on you, and that will take you down. And I saw a lot of good people, a lot of people in influential positions. Uh, you, you're seeing people in the city of Philadelphia go through this. You see high-level politicians, and uh, uh, it's always one of those three. Now, internally, when you're running your business, there's some, there's some situations you have to take care of. They're non-negotiables. And you see Penn State. Penn State got in trouble. Different colleges, different companies. Um, any form of sexual harassment, any form of uh, employee intimidation, any form of, of anything inappropriate uh, has to be investigated. It has to be an outside agent. Uh, the school or the company has to have a team of investigators to do that. It has to go through the decision process. And the, the lead executive, whether it be the president of the school or, or the, the lead executive in that company, has to make the final decision. And has to be part of that process and has to either put the, the thumb up, that there was no findings, or the thumb down, you're fired. And if it gets worse, which I was involved in many, many cases, and I was the deciding official basically in every court case. Uh, I sat down at 615 Market more, more days than I, I want to say, but uh, my team always dotted our I's and crossed our T's, and we were very, very successful uh, in, in anybody uh, involved in inappropriate conduct. Uh, also, the EEO process. Uh, folks starting out have got to understand that process, and they have to understand what will come back to bite you. Uh, and you, whether the allegations are right or wrong, you have to follow through the process, you have to do it in a timely manner, and you have to come to a result. You cannot leave things like that fester or hang around in the company. Any questions on that? Any, anything? Uh, Last but not least, I, I heard a couple of these guys talk about balance and life. And, and one of the things I was very, very lucky uh, was the balance of life. I never had a relocate. So I was born and raised in Philadelphia. Uh, I moved the grand total of, I think, one time. I got married, uh, lived in an apartment at uh, Upper Darby for about a year, bought a house, and I lived in the same house for 36 years. Uh, ended up raising my kids in the same house, and for some reason I can't get rid of them. Uh, but that's another story. But this is balance in life. This is the what and who. Uh, what are you and who are you? So the what you are is the postmaster of Philadelphia. The what you are is the doctor. The what you are is the president of the school. Uh, that should be 50% tops. Tops. Uh, you know, 50%, I, I, heard, I heard one of the gentlemen talk about that, and it, that is one of the most important uh, missions that you should have in life, opposed, you know, it, and it shouldn't be opposed to running the company, but you should definitely give it the 50% time and value and point to it. One job I was interviewed for, and it was for the general mail facility, and it was 24 hours a day, seven days a week, blah, 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 blah. And I had this panel of executives interviewing me. And they asked me a question about, you know, how do you handle this and how do you handle this and how, you know, I'm giving all the excellent. When we got all done, they said, do you have any questions? 
And I said, yeah. I said, how are you going to handle me never missing a little league game, uh, going to the first day of uh, kindergarten, first day of nursery school, blah, 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 and they're my non-negotiables. Now, if you can't live with that, I'm not taking the job. So I was up front, day one, and, you know, of course, people never thought I worked. I think they thought I was a bookie or something because they used to see me at every function, every school function, and, and, and all the above. But that was one of my non-negotiables when I took that 24-hour Sabbath job. And then it's who are you? Who are you? You're a son. You're a daughter. You're a father. You're a mother. You're a grandmother. You're a grandfather. And, and you have to put that 50%. And I used to cheat because I used to probably go on the other side, maybe 60 percent, 65 percent. And I was able to, you know, volunteer to do the coaching and, and do all the other stuff. But that that gets you to this point in life, to the retirement point in life. And uh, and so now uh, I heard about giving back, and uh, that's very important. <laughs> Yesterday, six o'clock in the morning. This is my other job. Yesterday at 6 o'clock in the morning, I have a part-time job. I pick up uh, six of my incarcerated teenage friends from Glen Mills School. I work up there Thursday, Friday, and Saturdays, and I work on the golf course side. But the school owns the golf course, so technically I am a, uh, an employee of the school. And one of my jobs up there is mentoring uh, young incarcerated teens. They're from all over the country. Uh, and spending time with them in a work atmosphere. Uh, telling them what the real deal is. Telling them you have to get up in the morning. You have to go to work. You have to support yourself. Uh, how to get into the trades. Uh, was able to navigate and direct a couple of folks when they got released into the trades. Uh, some kids are having a hard time because they got they were involved in drug busts and they were involved in gangbang killing. And they don't come off your record as, as, as easily. And trying to talk them and navigate and help them through. Now, I'm not the only person, but that's one of my roles up there, is some life skill uh, training and teaching to some of these folks. And uh, uh, that means a lot. But uh, I hope this fit the venue, John. And, and, uh, and oh, and by the way, I did graduate. I, got, I finally went back to college. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm part of the big five, but uh, I had to go, uh, I was accepted to Penn, I really was, but I went to uh, St. Joe's. I, I went to the Hall School, <laughs> thank you. So I got a degree from St. Joe's, and I was uh, accepted to the Wharton School of Business here, but I couldn't work out a deal with uh, these guys. Uh, I didn't want to go on Saturdays, and they wouldn't let me be part of that executive program, and they wanted me to go to school Saturdays. So I, I, I couldn't do it. So, uh, and fearless. I, the last thing I just want to say is I, I heard the word fearless. And I think that is not talked about enough. Uh, the one thing I learned from my parents is they were both fearless. Uh, and the one thing about Mother Teresa, she was fearless. And, and sometimes you have to be fearless. Uh, there was, I, I was part of three major investigations in my career. Uh, really tough, I went through some really tough times. Do you, got, do you folks remember the anthrax uh, situation that we had? Uh, we had a hundred, a hundred cases in the Philadelphia area that I, I personally investigated, I was personally, and I wanted to be the first person through the door. Uh, so every post office that had an alleged anthrax sighting uh, or processing facility I wanted to make it to be a point to be the first person to work with the inspection service team. And, uh, and you know, so the employees see the leader. The employees understand that the leader is, is taking this serious. Uh, he's not home in the office sending the team out to look to see if there's anthrax fight. And then, of course, you're saying to yourself, geez, I, if there is something in here, because at the time, uh, from a medical standpoint, uh, Folks didn't really know how long this would take to get you. And we did have, uh, I think, two or three folks that were killed in the postal service. Uh, another investigation that I, that I uh, went to on site, it was a attempted murder-suicide, uh, two, two postal employees. 
and I wanted to be, uh, once we heard it, I, I went there with the investigator, uh, the, uh, the inspector in charge, uh, spent probably 10 hours up. And the important thing is, is, is who you get in touch with. Uh, you need to get in touch with the, your unions, your local unions. I will always have my local unions involved in, in all my meetings, all my staff meetings. They would be briefed on, on any of the findings. Now, last but not least, uh, I, I was the, uh, the, the lead uh, to help an investigation team in, in, in the uh, accidental death of a, a three-year-old boy hit by a postal vehicle out in downtown, which was very tragic and, and very, very tough. And there are the types of days that uh, and weeks and months that really grind it down. And, and the fun part was leading the, your hometown city in the Postal Service, of being involved in the biggest project uh, uh, that the government ever expended capital uh, ventures on, which is the Lindbergh facility, and the transition of the Philly Post Office into Penn, and me being able to see everything you guys are doing uh, as a Penn organization with all that uh, old, dirty, ugly ground that we used to have with all those trucks on. So I'm really happy about that. But that's about all, all I have, John. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> we can take a short break. I would think we understand it. Let's go to Wikipedia and the dictionary. It's a qualification of being honest, strong moral principles, moral uprightness is a choice. It's a choice. The whole oneself to consistent moral and ethical standards. But it's also the quality or state of being complete, undivided, no duplicity. What you see is what you get. Walk the talk. It's a purpose driven life, predicated on service, truth, honor, and principles. And as I said before, a life of integrity is wholeness. One's actions and words are in concordance. I can summarize leadership with one sound by John Bacon. Doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason. So when you're in the OR, surgeons, the resident asks me, should we fix this meniscus? What's the right thing to do? Now it's time to do it. Why? This person got a better knee. That is the life of integrity. So again, we're here this morning not for egocentric reasons, but uh, to accomplish much. Follow your passion to see to fruition. The only way you can do that is self and through leadership of others. But those you lead, we heard this time and time again this morning, must buy into your mission. And only occurs in the context of trust. Because as we heard from our brilliant speakers this morning, no respect equals no buy-in. <coughs> no integrity, no trust. I'll repeat that. If you don't show integrity, there's going to be no trust. <coughs> because to lead, you really have to be the change you want to see. You are the change. You're the leader. I went to Dean Taylor's uh, Scott Fellowship uh, Forum about seven years ago. Anybody remember Pete Dawkins? Heisman Trophy winner and the Maxwell winner. He was a Rhodes Scholar and became CEO of Primerica. He had a sound bite that I never forgot. He said, leadership is who you are. As Mike this morning said, you know, the people that work with you, under you, they're just what's called, watch everything you do. They know who you are. We can lead by power and fear. That only works in the short term. You know, not get only approach. It doesn't work long term. Why? There's no loyalty. There's no buy-in. What happens when that jerk leaves the room? You can't believe he did that. No results in the absence of force and scare tactics. The only thing that we'll share about my father, he's a good man. He drank, he fought, he ruled by his fist, Kevin knows this. And I never forget, a Jesuit priest once shared me something he wrote on a retreat. He led his life with his fist, and then when his physical powers waned, guess what happened? He was scared to death. He, was, he said to the priest, I am now scared to death. Don't no, build your life. Build your life on rock, on moral principles, on your higher power. And finally, they don't know what, they don't care what you know until you know that you care. Leaders care. So how do we get trust? How do we buy into the mission? Stephen Covey 101. It's earned, it's not just manufactured. Trust is gained through trustworthiness. I walk the talk. 
My dad always said to me, actions speak louder than words. Oh, is he right? I could be here pontificating and saying all these things. I don't walk the talk. No buy-in. Eh, Kelly's up there just dreaming. I'm going to close the scripture. Whatever faith base you are, I hope I don't just defend you, whether it's uh, Jewish, Islamic, Christian. But this is a principle. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with very little can also be dishonest with much. Little things matter. Everything Dr. Levin does, the rest is watch. How he treats the scrub nurse, how he treats the orderlies, how he treats the cook, how he treats his bosses. If you yell at a nurse, you may think it's a little thing. It's a big thing. You dishonored someone's uh, integrity. And when I look at residents and fellows and interviews, I say, I look for letters from people that maybe don't have a high position. Like, how does he treat the staff? How does she talk to the nurses? How does he or she treat the orderlies? That's a measure of character. <laughs> you see, Covey said, trust begins with being trustworthy. And the quickest way to build trust is to make a promise and keep it, especially to yourself. You must trust yourself before others can trust you. Little things are the big things. If you can't trust a man in little things, you can't trust him in big things. I came across this. Does anyone know who General Ron Fogelman is? He was the Chief of Staff, U.S. Air Force. He wrote a whole article on leadership with integrity. These are four <coughs> qualities that General Fogelman describes. Sincerity, consistency, character, and good finishers. Sincerity. Again, what you see is what you get. Those of you who know me, I got a little passion, but I try to be authentic. And no curveballs, one of my patients would say, no curveballs. People say to me, what's wrong with my shoulder doctor? Well, you need to get it fixed. No curveballs, seriously, you have no curveballs. You need to get it fixed. Actions, you match your words, and that breeds loyalty. You know it's, a, it's predictable. Consistency is a biggie. We don't talk about this enough. Leaders apply uniform rules to all, regardless of their status. Whether you're a, a VIP or a street person, that grows to all the people that work with you and under you. You have to apply your standards even handily. And a single reach of integrity is a scar. No favorites. This is a parable in our faith that I love. Which of you end up have 100 sheep and lost one of them, wouldn't leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that was lost until he found it? When he has found it, he carries him on his shoulder rejoicing. When he comes home, he calls together his friends, his family, his neighbors, saying to him, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. The shepherd, the good shepherd, leaves the 99 and takes care of the one. 99 will notice how you treated the one. Because guess what? Whatever I say to themselves is, someday I may be the one. You see how this works, folks? It's just called integrity. Doing the right thing at the right time in all cases, all situations. I have found, Cubby says, the key to the 99 is the one, particularly the one who's testing the patience and the good humor of the many. It's the love and discipline of the one student, the one child, who communicates love for the others. It's how you treat the one that reveals how you regard the 99, because everybody is ultimately a one. <clears throat> Scott Levin, what you see is what you get. He treats me the same way he treats Brian, the same way he treats uh, Neil. What you see is what you get. And with this, great leaders recognize that everyone has value. That's called a healthy culture. It's not, <clears throat> I've been to parties of another health system where the residents eat on this floor, the interns in the basement, and the uh, fellows on the second floor. Come on. You can't live a perfect day without doing something for someone you will never repay. John Wooden. Did John Wooden have a healthy culture? Well, let's say uh, he won 11 national championships. No one would ever do that again. And talk about process and a leader. Never, ever, ever, it's been said, mention the word win during any of his talks to his players. Let's focus on the process. If we do these things right, we'll be okay. And you have to have substance. John Wooden also had substance. He just didn't walk this walk or talk this talk of integrity. It was time tested. It was battle tested. In 1947, he was invited to an NCAA tournament, an invitation in the Midwest. Oh, Dr. Wood, we played our tournament. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, there's one uh, caveat. No African Americans can play. You know what John Wooden said? Hogue Mahone. Anybody know Gaelic? Mm -hmm. That means kiss my tuchus. That's what he said. <coughs> Prove your organization you will not be compromised during the storm. He proved to his players he ain't compromised. He ain't, hey, I got two African American players. Forget it. Take that, you know what? And 
Dr. Or General Fogelman also mentioned good finishers in all that you do, everything. Performing all tasks to the max extent of your ability. Talk about excellence. Despite the importance of a task, or <coughs> who gets the credit? We're in a credit mongering society. You know, first author, second author, blah, 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 blah. You want to stay in high energy, folks? Focus on the good. Focus on getting it done because that paper is going to help somebody. It's not about you, it's about the cause. How many times have you heard that this morning? This was described by General Marshall. Actually, Charles Montague said this in the 20s. There's no limit to what a man can do so long as he doesn't care, struggle, gets the credit. Why? We spend so much of our internal energy about credit. And am I the first author? Am I going to get the grant for this and that guy? Blah, blah, blah. Just get her done. So, this is not the ethereal, this is the real. How do you build integrity? And I uh, have to uh, respect this for some of the other speakers. You can build integrity, you can build leadership skills. Individual acts integrity lead to a habit. It takes about three weeks, but I want you all to think about this. Apply integrity to all that you do, no matter how small or inconsequential. Place principles of people, fear, and even laziness. And leaders bring excellence to the ordinary. Chuck Noll took over the Steelers. They were a terrible team. I think Kevin, they're like three and 10. Next year, turn around, they're a winner. One year. Why? He focused on the fundamentals, the little things. Champion for champions, not because they do anything extraordinary, but because they do the ordinary things better than anybody else. Fundamentals. Do the little things in your life with excellence, with integrity. Because C.S. Lewis says integrity is doing the right thing even when nobody's watching. Even when nobody's watching. You know, the coach John Wooden again, he said, the best pillow is a clear conscience. When you live your life that way, guess what? I got a lot of balls I'm hanging right now. I sleep at night. Only because of these principles, not because I'm special. <clears throat> it's ironic, I read this book. This is another game changer book called The Four Agreements by Miguel Ruiz. And the four agreements he says in a little peaceful and productive life are, and what I do, Dan, I just hit the wrong button. Okay. Are, be impeccable with your word. Boy, he's good, isn't he? Wow. <laughs> wow. I told you he was good. Don't take anything personally, as Larry Kaiser said. Don't make assumptions, and probably most of all, whatever you do, every bet you like, always, always, always do your best. There are the seeds of a leader. There are the seeds of a peaceful and productive life. And finally, as Dr. Kaiser said, you got to do when you're wrong. That's authentic, right? Take this quote from Bear Bryant. If anything goes bad, I did it. <coughs> if anything goes semi-good, we did it. If anything goes really good, then you did it. That's all it takes to get people to win football games for you. How many championships did Bear Bryant win? Six. No one will ever do that again. Robert E. Lee said, after Pickett's charge, abysmal failure. Abysmal, just a bad idea. Many, many people died needlessly. All this has been my fault. It is I who have lost this fight. After his troops heard this, they would have walked on glass with their lips for this guy. He's authentic. He owns his mistakes. He was one of the greatest leaders of all time. I didn't like his cause, but he was a leader. So, in summary, an integrated leader, example of honor, he places the mission and results above all self-interest. He walks the talk. Integrity is doing what he or she says and saying what he or she does. Treat everybody the same. Acknowledge mistakes. And we're talking about being a person of character. And again, you have to have trust. People have to buy in. No integrity, no trust. Anybody know who this man is? This is Mike and I's football coach in college, William B. Campbell, who left coaching, became the CEO of Intuit Software, and, and board chairman of Apple Computer. He has mentored the greatest, Steve Jobs, Steve Bezos. What did Bill Campbell have that no one else had? He had integrity. We had church service for football games. He got Mike and me jobs in the off season. He got me tutors. He cared. When I went to him for a problem, which we all had many, he listened. And he always had a good, integrated answer. That's why when Bill Campbell spoke, I listened. He passed away last year. NASDAQ gave him a moment of silence. There's a lead. So I want you all, when you leave today, to concentrate your life to integrity one step at a time, and others will follow. I promise you they will. Thank you for your attention. Scott, we have the blessing of being involved with a clinical trial with Trice Medical, doing a, doing a product of my eye. 
and a big board who I love and revere said, hey, John, this may be interesting to speak. What I heard was good for Penn North Peaks. I can listen to this. <clears throat> I go to this meeting in Las Vegas. I walk in this room. I see all these really, really cool people. And this guy goes, hey, I'm Jeff. I'm from Philly. We start talking about things. <clears throat> Eye contact, sincere, listen to me. Then I find out he's the CEO of the company. That's a great uh, testament to a man of character. He is the CEO of Trice Medical. <clears throat> Chief Executive Officer. He founded this firm in 2011. He was Managing Director of Biostar Ventures. He was a venture partner at Biostar as well. Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of Umbrella, part of Vascular, I can go on and on. Jeff O'Donnell is a man that gets things done, and he is able to translate vision to reality. Besides that, he has built a great culture at Trice Medical. Why? I met his staff. They all love him. They're all kind people. They buy into it. Jeff's going to talk to us about Fulfilling the vision. So, Jeff, thanks for joining this morning. My name is Jeff O'Donnell. I'm from Philadelphia. I, uh, I've been in the medical device business for about 32 years. My job is to take physicians' ideas and turn them into products that are better for patients. What I like to do is I like to create products that uh, fulfill three uh, goals. The first goal is it's got to be excellent for the patient, meaning better outcomes for patients. The second, it has to be fulfilling for physicians and profitable for their organization. And the third is that it has to be better for the insurance companies. If we can fulfill those three goals, we can create a great medical device company. I'm a regular guy that's got a kind of extraordinary career. I was out in Las Vegas. Uh, at a conference, as Dr. Kelly said, and I had my company out there which is launching this product. We're starting a clinical trial, and we went through the conference, and I said, are you going to have dinner with me later? And he said, I am going to have dinner with you, but I'm going to go to Mass first. I'll meet you back at the restaurant. And I said, I love this guy. So I got my team together, and I said, where are we going to start this clinical trial? And they said, we're going to start at this institution. I said, we're not. I said, the University of Pennsylvania is the greatest hospital in the United States. And Dr. Kelly has more integrity than any physician I've met in the last 30 years. Get him to be the PI, and when the paper's written, people will believe it. Thanks for doing that. So I'll talk a little bit about my career and, and some of my, uh, my principles. Uh, I went to LaSalle High School. I went to LaSalle University. And my first job was at Johnson & Johnson Orthopedic Sales Rep back in 1980. Selling the Charlie Hip. I don't know if anybody remembers the Charlie Hip. So I had a great job coming out of LaSalle, and here I am in the operating room helping physicians uh, size orthopedic implants. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe the leadership that I was seeing in an operating room, how they can orchestrate and really kind of be the air traffic controller of helping this patient. An amazing career. I then went to Boston Scientific, and after that I wanted to start my own company. I was the CEO of a company in Exit, and I won't mention it because my experience there wasn't great. I made a lot of money that products used at Penn today, but the leadership of that company was not excellent. I was the VP of uh, Sales and Marketing, and I was worried about the environment that I was in. I had a mentor come to me, and he said, Jeff, you're in a bad company. I said, you know, I, I think I am in a bad company. And that mentor asked me to come to California and start a company with him, which we took public in 1996. The pearls that I can give you today is that you have to surround yourself with excellent mentors. You have to be able to identify people that are good. You have to be able to identify people that have integrity. You have to find that out genuinely because there's a lot of leaders out there that are fakes. I started the company in California. I ran it for 11 years. I came back here. I started another company. I've been lucky enough to be the CEO of six medical device companies. I've taken two public. I sold a few off. Today, I sit as chairman of two public medical device companies, and I've got Trice. One of the most successful things that I've seen in business is people surrounding themselves with the best people they can hire. People that hire uh, subordinates that they like to boss around and show off and don't have the skill sets that they have are going to build a weak organization. We hire the best, we only hire the best, 
who work with the best physicians at the best hospitals. And if you do that, the ingredients are there for success. I'm going to go through some pearls here of uh, some of the things that I expect from the leaders that we're developing in the medical device business. So these are positive pearls. There's nine positive pearls that I think are good uh, things to remember. First, positive leaders drive positive cultures. The culture that you create in your organization, whether it's a medical practice or a company, is so important. It's the furniture, it's the flowers, it's the people you hire, it's how you talk to people, whether you talk down to people. Are you competitive? I don't really want to work with a lot of competitive people. I want to work with collaborative people. I want to work with people that are going to make my organization better and that can come in the room and have a didactic conversation about what we're doing and where we should be going. <coughs> positive leaders create and share positive vision. You can't fake it. You've got to have a vision, you've got to have goals, and you've got to have structure around those goals. Positive leaders, again, apologize for my cold. Positive leaders lead with um, a positive attitude at all times. So before you come into work and before you come to your practice, shake it off. Shake off the regular things that get you down. Get yourself in a model of a, a mode where you're modeling behavior that you expect from your patients or your patients, from your uh, practice staff and from your company. Positive lead leaders confront, transform, and remove negativity. I have no time for negative people. I have all the time in the world for a collaborative discussion, a didactic discussion that is going to result in a good decision. Positive leaders create, unite, and connect teams. A connector is a great, uh, a great asset if you have it. If you have connections and can network with people and help people out with jobs or their families or their children and getting into schools or directing them to the right physician, that's the value add that a leader really needs to have. Positive leaders build great relationships and teams. I'll show you my last slide is one that I'm most proud of. And it has nothing to do with the event. It has everything to do with the people that I surround myself with. We pursue excellence, we lead with purpose, and we have grit. So I think that if you're going to be leading a practice or being in a leadership position in a hospital or running a company or even being a Boy Scout leader, you need to understand what excellence is, have a plan, have a purpose, make sure that the people around you understand that plan, buy into that plan, and understand the purpose. And having a little grit is not a bad idea. Life's tough sometimes. Sometimes you've got to be a little tougher. <coughs> Accountability. The people that work at Trice, Umbrella, Photomedics, uh, Endosonics, all these companies that I've been blessed uh, to lead, everybody has to understand that I have a high level of accountability. I set myself to a standard that is really kind of tough, but I'm trying to model the behavior that I expect from my employees because we're manufacturing, developing, and designing implants and products that are used in patients. So there's no passengers, there's no room in my car for passengers. So we need to have a, a high level of accountability in the medical device business. There's a line. You can be above the line or you can be below the line. This line separates people and their level of accountability. You've got to decide which side of the line you're going to be on. And there's plenty of people on both sides. To be above the line uh, in leadership and in developing people, you try to make sure that they know that we expect you to see a problem, see an opportunity, see an issue, own the problem, solve the problem, and do it. Get involved. Don't be a passenger. Above the line is the best place to be in any organization. It's exciting. It's fulfilling. Below the line is more of a victim. Now, if you feel that you are more comfortable in an environment where you like to wait and see, 
or point the finger or give me the excuse that that's not your job. You're not a leader. Don't put yourself in a position. We were talking a little bit earlier about leadership and how we have to develop leaders. We do have to develop leaders, but we also have to help people understand where's their position on the team. Not everybody is a leader. I think it's a leader's responsibility to really have people in the organization understand what the goals are. So the goals are really not to get the PMA approved. The goals are really not to get the product 510K approved. The goals are really not to do the first in man. The goals have to be smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound goals. Meaning you break the whole process of building a medical device company, creating a medical implant, and you break it down into pieces, and you actually put specific tasks, goals, times, and bonuses involved in all those uh, tasks. And this is where it becomes exciting. People like structure. People enjoy knowing exactly what the goal is, but they also have to buy into how we're going to get there. And we implement the smart goal system at all of our companies. This picture hangs in my office and has for a long time. It's pretty exciting. People come into my office and they go, oh my gosh, that must have been a great day. We've taken two of these companies public on NASDAQ. This is a picture in 2005. I uh, have gotten some gray hair since 2005. <laughs> but people say you must have been so proud. You started the company, you built the product, you got it approved, you implemented it. Patients are doing really well because that product and that team got together, understood the goals, and got it approved. And that's really not why the picture hangs in my office. The picture hangs in my office because out of the 17 people that are in that picture, only two don't work with us today. All of the people in that picture, including my son, works for us today and have for the last four companies. That's what makes us proud. And I believe that they continue to work with us because of integrity and because they understand the goals and they believe <coughs> that my team can get us there. Thank you. <clears throat> For me, this is a, a very, very emotional. Uh, for me, a highlight, uh, in addition to my brother being here, is Kevin Riley is, the, is my second brother. Kevin uh, played football for her name. He was a football mentor to Mike and me uh, in many ways. He was an emotional mentor. Let me tell you about Kevin Riley. You know, we all know he played for the Eagles. He was special teams captain. He's in the Villanova Hall of Fame. Uh, I was on the five-year plan, Scott, in college because of so we say focus issues and the football thing, interview with studies, and a few Jack Daniels here and there. But uh, I was in New York when Kevin was diagnosed uh, with a rare and serious tumor. And uh, now we had a lot of pressures growing up, Mike and I. And uh, you know, my dad was a good guy, but he did uh, was very invested in our football careers, and, and I felt a lot of pressure. One year before camp, he said to me, Johnny, go up there and just do your best and don't forget. No matter what happens this year at camp, we still love you. Wow. That was the most important thing anyone ever said to me uh, as a young man. So I up there and I went and gave my best. And it was from that love from Kevin Riley that I was able to get through camp and do well. That's a leader. So Kevin, when he got diagnosed, I was a fifth year student. He was in slow Kettering. I went by his bedside, I said a rosary the night before, I said a rosary the night after surgery. That was my way of giving back to my big brother growing up. He is a leader in every way. He's inspired me through overcoming cancer and became the leading salesman for Xerox after losing his left arm to cancer. So Kevin's going to talk to us about the human spirit and how leaders lead by their actions. So Kevin, God bless you for coming this morning. Still shooting the 90s, one arm, how about that? 
Yeah, Ken, I've never broken 90. That's just, that's just the front nine. <laughs> Uh, thanks, John. Yeah, we are, uh, we consider ourselves brothers from another mother. So, uh, it's really good to see the, the Kelly twins here today. And, uh, Ten minutes is all I have, and so as Elizabeth Taylor said to her eighth husband, I won't keep you long. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, I always got to get ground, but I played with the Eagles. Do we have any Dallas Cowboy fans in the house? No? Okay, I won't have to talk slower, that's good. <laughs> On my way here today, I couldn't help but coming up my 85, gosh, the rain is terrible, and every time I pass by Widener University, I get the chills. That's where I spent three, of three summers in the worst heat and conditions in Dick Vermeil's uh, football camp. And so the first year that he was there, there was a guy by the name of Ron Jaworski, I think you guys yeah. recognize that name. Well, Ron, very gregarious guy, you see him on TV. Shula had a rule, quarterbacks couldn't have a roommate during a training camp because he wanted them to be focused on, on uh, all of their uh, assignments, film watching, and Ron took exception to it. And he let the press know. And when he let the press know, they put it out there, and sure enough, one of those great fans from the 700 level sent him a parrot to keep him company during all those long hours of watching film. We're leaving camp. After 10 weeks, I got to get down to Wilmington, Delaware. I don't have to go far. Ron's in the parking lot, and he's flagging me down. I thought he had car trouble. I pull up. He says, oh, my God, thank God you're still here. He said, the parents. I said, what about the parents? He said, I want nice to learn to I can't take it home. The kids in the dorm are all tortured. It's about a $500 animal. It's been a great companion to me. Why don't you take it home and give it to your mom? I said, well, what? Really? He goes, yeah, I mean, come on. Do me a favor. Well, he's the starting quarterback. I'm just the captain of special teams. We throw the bird in my car, we head down, I head down 95, I get to the Delaware State line for the next two miles. The only thing it says is, hello, my name's Susie, I'm a swinger. My name's Susie, I'm a swinger. <laughs> I have no idea what else your worst he's taught in 10 weeks, but I'm not taking it over to my mom. So the only thing I can think of, I know, I'll take it down to my biology teacher, Bobby Gloria, at my high school, Salesianum. He'd love to have this parent. Well, he would, except he didn't have a long-term budget for it, but he said, I have a simple solution for you, follow me. And so he said, short term, he said, I can keep this bird. Here's what we'll do. And before I walk in, and he's got animals all over the place. He's got these two beautiful uh, parrots in a cage. And the next thing I know, he says, uh, watch this. And he reaches into his pocket, grabs a rosary, opens the, the uh, door to the cage, throws the rosary in, and in my amazement, the two birds start to say the rosary. He said, I took the senior class six months to teach these birds how to say the rosary. Now they're the biggest conversation pieces in the city of Wilmington. Senator Biden has bring, brought diplomats in to see the praying parrots. And last week, the bishop brought a cardinal in to see the praying parrots. So, he said, here's the other thing. As a biology teacher, I'll tell you, the parrots are the biggest mimics in the animal kingdom. Put your bird in the cage with my two birds, and we're going to say the rosary. Then you can take it over to your mom. But what do I have to lose? Just as I'm getting ready to exit the lab, short enough, my bird speaks and says, hello, my name's Susie, I'm a swinger. And with that, one of his looked at the other and said, Drop the beach, Jack, our prayers have been answered. <laughs> I'm not here to answer your prayers, and I think you've heard a lot about leadership today. I'm going to give you what I call the monarch notes, the short version, and some really good uh, <clears throat> quotes that I've picked up. And I'll just start first, and then I want to talk a little bit about resiliency, because that's really my topic. But, uh, you know, in being in the NFL, uh, I played for three football teams, and I saw three different types of coaches. Uh, Don Shula was the first coach that uh, coached me down at the Miami Dolphins. They were coming off a Super Bowl year. And the good traits that I learned from Coach Shula was he was, number one, fair and consistent. If you're going to be a good leader in business, coaching, even as a father, as a parent, as a mother, make sure that you're fair and consistent. You will get a lot less aggravation, and sometimes it's hard to stand up to, but I will tell you that that is the thing to do. The other thing that Shula talked about, and two of our speakers have already mentioned it, setting goals. Don had a saying, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. And I can't tell you how many people just wander through life without a short-term six-month goal, a one-year goal, and they do. 
And if you don't have goals, you're really going to be wandering around for a long time. <laughs> the other great thing about um, Don Shula was he really believed that there was no individual above anybody else. As a matter of fact, they won back-to-back -back Super Bowls with a defense called the no-name defense because they didn't have a name. They were all just integral parts of a chain and pulling together, they wowed the NFL without even a second string all pro on that defensive front line. And that's because every guy did his job. So those were the little, little nuggets I got from Shula. I never really played for Dick Vermeil, but we've become very, very good friends. And the things that I've learned from him over time is he's a grinder. He's a guy that believes in strong work ethic. A couple of his famous quotes are, hard work is not a punishment. And the millennials today really think that that may be true. But hard work is not a punishment. Hard work will get you a lot of things. The other thing that he says about keeping the process going, which we talked about earlier, if you have a good process, you can do a lot of things. And keeping that process together. And he said, there's only one way to coast, and that's downhill. And his point was, as soon as you start to level off on anything, your next step is downhill. You've got to keep it fresh. You've got to keep it energized. You've got to keep the passion up, especially if you're heading towards a goal. The most important quote I got from him about leadership, and this is so true again in parenting, it's so true in coaching, is people don't care about how much you know until people know about how much you care. And I'll use another coach in the NFL that I played for named Chuck Fairbanks. He was the opposite of Coach Vermeule. Coach Fairbanks, when he came in from Oklahoma, he had 100 guys on the football team. And he had a bang heads every day. And somebody got injured, he'd say, move over and let the next guy come up. And he had that kind of talent and he continued to do it. He was a uh, disciplinarian. He was not fair and consistent. And he always took shots at you about whatever, um, you know, whatever problems you had or detriments in your playing ability. He was always demeaning. And I will tell you that Chuck Fairbanks did not make it in the NFL because he was able to get away with that with 18 and 19 year olds. But when you're dealing with young men 24 to 30, they're not buying into that program. Coach Vermeil said, even if you lead by fear, you will get to your goal occasionally, but you will never break through the barrier to super success because people won't follow you any, any further than that. And then the last guy that I really uh, like a guy named Dick LeBeau. He played 15 years in the NFL as a defensive back, mostly with the Detroit Lions. And um, he was a special teams coach when I was in, uh, when I was with the Eagles. It was his first year as coach. He was 13 years out of the 15. He was all pro in the NFL. So here was a guy that I respected. And you talk about trust. I trusted the guy. He was a player. He knew what we went through. And he just had a way about him that was as a leader, this is so important, demanding but not demeaning. Demanding but not demeaning. To give you an example, Chuck Fairbanks would watch you make an error on a film and berate you in front of the entire team till you felt like crawling under the chair. Dick Laveau would see that on the fourth time on a kickoff, I missed my block for the first time, I made it the first three. I can see that. I'm 23 years old. I can see I missed my block. Everybody in the room can see I missed my block. And all he says is, Kevin, I know it's tough to make this block four out of four times, but you did a great job the first three times, and I need you to get it done a fourth time. And he left it at that. Now, I'm, I'm encouraged. This guy believes in me. He didn't demean me in front of the crowd. As a matter of fact, he complimented me before he told me about my you know, misjudgment and missing the, the tackle. So those are a couple of things that I just wanted to share with you. Be demanding, but not demeaning. And you cannot believe how your respect will grow in any organization when you treat the little people right. As a matter of fact, Coach Shula tells a story that when he was coaching in Virginia, that when he went to a high school to recruit a kid, he would go to the coaches, he would go to the principal, and before he left the building, he would go to the janitor 
and he would go to the lunch lady and want to know how this kid treated him because to him that was important. And if they treated the little people right, he knew that he was going to have a guy that could play on his football team. So never underestimate the power of that. And John put up a great slide. He had the other 99 sheep bar watching when one person is being helped. Don't forget that. The other thing I want to talk to you about because going through life, you're going to face challenges and some of them are going to be pretty catastrophic and how you handle them will be everything. I've had a couple of those situations and I'll just share you know, my comeback from losing my arm, my shoulder, and four ribs. That's a prosthetic device made of Kevlar. You guys know what Kevlar is? Bulletproof. If I'm ever in a fight in a Philadelphia bar, I'm leading with this shoulder. <laughs> you imagine if somebody stabbed me and I got back up and I said, is that your best shot? <laughs> but I, I, uh, I digress because the, after I woke up from the operation and I was in my room out of intensive care, I started to wonder what would I be able to do. And I remember I had little picture of my two-year-old, my one-year-old, my infant, and I had to put them down because every time I looked at them I started to cry. How will I be a father to them? Will Xerox have me back as a salesperson or will they put me in the back room? Man, I was so low on confidence I can't even tell you. And the biggest question I had is, did the doctor get margins on this tumor? Because if he didn't, it was going to come back and it would probably kill me. So, I asked the head nurse when she came in that morning, I said, I do not want any visitors or phone calls today. And she said, okay, what's your problem? I said, you know, I gotta wrap my head around this and I haven't hit the ground yet, I haven't hit the basement, I'm not ready to come up and be positive. And that's all I said to her. About an hour into my pity party, which she called it, a guy appeared at my doorway, I didn't know who he was, but he had a white schmock on and he had credentials. He knocked on my door jam. Before I could say come in, he walked in, and then when he came in, I knew we had something in common. His name was Frank, and he was in his mid-60s. He was missing his left arm as a, a victim of World War II, and he was a volunteer. And he was there to volunteer that day to help me get over this recent loss of a limb. And he came in, and he was very helpful with some little gadgets he brought me that I could use uh, with one arm. And, and he said to me, you know, the real reason I'm here today is to make sure you have an exercise program before you, um, you know, bef before you leave the hospital. And I'm like, exercise Like, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm not a thing on my radar, Frank. you got to be kidding me. An exercise program? I'm worried about that the guy got all of the tumor, blah, 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 blah. He goes, no, no, no. He said, it's very important. He said, we find out that most handicapped people, and that word hit me in the middle of the forehead, like a 230-pound fullback on my nice <coughs> walk. I wasn't ready for that label. Guess what? That's what I was. He said, we find out that most amputees will gain an average of 30 to 40 pounds in the first 18 to 24 months that they're with, without an arm or a leg. Due to inactivity, you can all hear me, right? Yeah. Due to inactivity, due to drugs, due to depression. And then they're back in here with heart problems, high blood pressure, and in your case, it could be disc problems in your back. You got about 24 pounds on one side and you don't have one on the other. Oh, well, I didn't think about that. So he started to ask me some questions about what life I do. And I said, I, you know, I like to jog. I just started doing some 5Ks. And as a matter of fact, I said, you know, I get together with these, some of the guys that I play high school football with. And we jog on Saturday mornings. We have coffee effort. For the first time in a week, I'm starting to get a little bit of passion, and a little bit of positivity going. Only to have this guy go, whoa, 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 okay, way too fast. He said, you're missing so much on the left side of your body. You have no idea. It's going to be very, very fortunate for you within a year to you get your balance back walking. You cannot go out of here and start jogging. Okay. What else do you like to do? I said, well, you know, um, I just joined the DuPont Country Club. How about this? He said, whoa, I'm so glad you brought that up. He said, first of all, I said, that doesn't have the aerobic activity that we're looking for. Second of all, I want to tell you that I had a friend, and I want to tell you this because it just dawned on me. I'm glad you brought it up. He said, one day, play it from the right side. On a cold day when the ground was frozen, he said he took that swing back and without that left arm as a guy, he hit two inches behind the ball, the club didn't come through, his wrist did. And he ended up eight weeks in a cast with his right arm. And I said, your point is? He said, you gotta take care of your good arm or you're gonna find out your real friends are. And he didn't have to paint me any pictures. Well, he could see that I was spiraling down a little bit. 
And then he says to me, what do you have to wear to work at your office? I said, I have to wear a shirt and tie, suit, and dress shoes, you know, tie dress shoes. Oh, he said, like this? And he put his foot up on my bed, and it was a pair of wingtip tie shoes. I said, yeah, I got a pair like that, just the same color in my, in my uh, uh, closet. He said, not like this pair, you know. And with that, he took my hand, and he said, hold on to this little flap. And when I did, he said, pull up on it. When I pulled up on it, it was a Velcro flap. The shoes were pre-tied. He said, if you're going to have to wear these type of shoes, you're going to have to get these pre-tied shoes. And I said, why? He said, you'll never be able to tie your shoes again. It can't be done. I've been trying for over 30 years. And then he asked me to pull on his tie. And at that point, I really glad he didn't ask me to pull on his finger. <laughs> he pulled on his tie. It was one of those clip-on ties that I wore in grade school. I went to Catholic grade school. And uh, my mother didn't have time to tie my tie. So you know, I always took one tie to school. And he said, if you go down to 30th and, and 5th Avenue and you use my name, they'll give you a 10% discount on the clip one ties and make sure you get a dozen. Everybody calls me and wants to know where that place is again. And I said, why will I have to do that? He said, you'll never be able to tie your tie again. It can't be done one hand. I've been trying to <laughs> Well, here's my point. Not only did I go back to running, I've run four, a five half marathons and a ring tour full marathon. And I broke a 90 and golf on two occasions, something that I never did with two arms. And I don't tell you that to say, look what I've accomplished. I tell you that because one guy came into my life, 99 to 1, and saved me from being a whiner, a complainer, and somebody who was going to walk around saying, woe is me. He made me step up to this challenge. And it was really interesting because an hour later, I got a call from a guy by the name of Rocky Blyer who played with the Steelers. If you don't know Rocky's story, it's really tremendous. He got, he got injured in Vietnam in his right leg, and he was told he would never even walk again without a limp, and he would never play football. He ended up having four Super Bowl rings, and he called me to make sure that I wasn't going to set the bar low. I'm a peer visitor down at Walter Reed Hospital. The one thing I love about Walter Reed versus all the other hospitals where I visit amputees is their attitude is here and it's a cultural thing. They want to know how they get back on. How do I get on, back on track? And the one thing that Rocky <coughs> Pryor told me, he said, has any of the doctors, lawyers, or whoever been into, you know, tell you about your rehab? And I said, no, but as a matter of fact, it's really well volunteer to come in today and press the hell out. And he listened. And then after he got done talking to me, he said, you must promise me something. I said, what's that? He said, you must promise me that you will not quit on anything unless you try it a dozen times. I said, Rock, you know, I love your passion and enthusiasm. But guess what? <laughs> this guy's been missing an arm for 30 years. I think he's a little more of an expert than you or I. And that's when Rocky said, let me tell you something about expert trials. He said, experts built the Titanic and amateurs built the ark. Experts get me wrong. <laughs> and so I bought that. And I said, I'm not going to reach the I'm not going to lower the bar. And he said, you must promise me that you won't change any goal that you had before you lost your arm. I said, I'll try to do that. I really will. And one step led to another. We talked about processes. We talked about this, that, and the other. And I'm not saying it was easy, but it was a grind. And to help me along the way, Rocky sent me a little poem that he said helped him out a lot. Because he said, a lot like you, I was a man that didn't have any patience. And he said, your biggest problem going forward is going to be having patience. And instead of stepping back and counting to 10, say this little poem to yourself, and I think it'll help you. It goes like this. If you think you're beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you like to win, but you think you can't, it's almost a sense that you won't. If you think you'll lose your loss, for in this world we find success begins with a fellow's will. It's all in the state of mind. Remember, life's battles don't always go to the biggest, fastest, or smartest man. But sooner or later, the man who wins is the man who thinks he can. <coughs> so, you know, I followed that advice, and there's really three things I found out I can't do. I can't play the guitar, I can't jump rope by myself, and I can't get the number one side left-handed to angry motorists on 995. <laughs> but again, I just tell you that when I walk into a hospital, whether it's here or it's Sloan Kettering or uh, MD Anderson, I already go in there and I know my job is to raise the bar.
because all the families come in, all of the friends and the sympathizers. And their empathy is, oh, we're going to treat you as if you're handicapped. And that's not what these people want. And I tell you that because you can overcome a lot of things. This is the biggest lesson I learned through this, and I'll let you go into this. The human spirit is stronger than anything that can happen to you. The human spirit is stronger than anything that can happen to you. The problem is, we always wait until we are in the worst corner, the worst challenge of our life. And we come out kicking and fighting and we find out that it's there. You don't have to wait until you have a crisis in life to challenge yourself with the human spirit. Set a goal that maybe is above your head and go after it like nobody's business. And you'll find that out. So I hope you get a little bit out of this from you know, my experiences. And I'm really glad to be here today to some of the future doctors and nurses or whatever are here because I'll tell you this, there may be no such thing as magic, but because of the people like you in this room and how you're learning, there are miracles, and they happen every day right here in Philadelphia. Thank you very much. Kevin, unbelievably inspiring. <clears throat> so we're gonna have about two more talks and then we'll convene. And I'm going to bring my friend Marlene DeMeo, Captain DeMeo, uh, who is uh, not only decorated in the military, but also in women's health and orthopedics. She is a <coughs> graduate from Brown University, had a residency training at Yale, and sports medicine fellow from Cincinnati. More importantly, uh, she has led the way for many, many female orthopedists. She's the proud father of two daughters, uh, living in a male-dominated profession. She has really shown a lot of character and overcome a lot of adversity. She's the first female winner of the U.S. Medicine Dental, Delta Dental Berry Award, the inaugural winner of the Senior Female Leadership Award, the Military Healthcare System, the first female <coughs> chair of AOSM Program Committee. Besides all that, she's taken on the uh, challenge of uh, helping our VA system here in Philadelphia, which is no uh, small task. So Marlene is going to talk to us about the things that she learned leadership-wise in the military. Marlene, thank you. was my task. Uh, my disclosures that we do for uh, medical talks. And here's the slot, couple slides here I really uh, toiled with as to whether I should put them in or not. So I spoke to a very good friend of mine, uh, a man who used to command the skies as well as Marines. He said, just because Professor Kelly tells you that you're here to talk about leadership, it doesn't mean that you have any street cred. So why do I put this up? I've had a number of leadership positions that I had as an opportunity in the Navy, not only as a doctor, uh, but as an officer of men and women, where my teams were one or 250. And my job was to get us to see our mission and vision and accomplish our goals. And I was really lucky. I had an amazing career. I met some of the best people I've met in my life. I'm thrilled to be here at Penn and meet more great people. And so my biggest disclosure is I have a passion for U.S. Navy people. So I just want to say, uh, this bumper sticker is an old one, and it is currently not politically correct. And some of our residents are in the back, and they know that I, too, am not politically correct when I feel something is true. For me, maybe it was an amazing adventure. Um, I think I was, yeah. So again, a variety of careers from officer indoctrination school when I volunteered in 1992 uh, on ship and on sea. And yes, we're supposed to save lives, but as military officers, we have to know how to use weapons. Why? To protect our patients. Because if we can't protect our patients, we can't take care of them. I, had, uh, I met uh, some people at the uh, Naval Academy through sports when I had the distinct honor to lead the men and women at the Naval Academy and uh, teach on ethics and leadership there and also be the head team physician and work with the football team. And I think that that's one of the reasons why sports medicine doctors are so interested and love leadership, because we know that the best leaders need a great team, and we, as leaders, are a reflection of our team and vice versa. Uh, this is another slide that I uh, toyed on um, uh, putting, not putting in. Uh, I was on the White House team, and we took care of President Clinton. Uh, I was one of his surgeons. Uh, I had the honor to give a press conference that I didn't have any preparation for. Uh, and so why do I leave this slide in? I am, I am here to tell you 
that the care that the president got was the same care an enlisted man got two weeks ago and before his surgery. They wanted to bring in the team that was not an orthopedic team. They were not trained in this surgery. And I was a junior officer, and I spoke up and said to the head team physician, or the head physician for the White House, no, because we needed to have a team that was skilled, that was trained, and knew how to do it. Because believe me, yes, this was a high stakes surgery. Uh, but we also had, and our residents are in the back, I want to tell you, that we wanted to do this things exactly the same. And we were a teaching institution, and we had residents, and Lieutenant Joe Campbell and Lieutenant Dan Sewell participated in that surgery. And they got to meet everybody on the White House uh, team, and they were there, and they helped make that surgery go smoothly. Um, one of my, uh, Kevlar, yes, I'm familiar with it. Um, it's part of a body armor system that we helped develop for this war. Um, this was another slide I debated not to put in, but if you want to look at some of the things I've done, you won't be able to see this work because it's still classified. It's in a book, but it's not about me again. It's about the team that we assembled, and yes, we got awards. I put each and every one of my 70 top five member team in for military awards, and then what did they do? They, they put me in for an award that was delivered to this, by the Assistant Secretary of Defense, my family was there, and you bet, I made sure that every one of those 75 members team was at that Pentagon when I got up there and represented them. What a great day. So, like any career over the last you know, 20 years, we've had ups, we've had downs. I was at the Pentagon when the plane crashed into the building, and I saw amazing acts of valor from junior enlisted to civilian to the uh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, who had to be physically restrained from not going back into that building to save people. Uh, I've been on hospital ships uh, as a leader there, and then I also had uh, the opportunity to be at Camp Delta, where I got to face some of the people that were uh, part of that 9-11 uh, event. And uh, it's, it's really amazing uh, to see what the, the military is a part of. So. Uh, I wish when I was a junior officer and in medical school and residency that I had been able to be a part and listen to the incredible talks that you've heard today because I learned it through the school hard knocks. And so the last couple of minutes you've heard about, I guess you could say some successes. What you didn't hear about were the, uh, the I would say, near successes <laughs> and absolute failures. And from that, I, I personally learned, and I also have had the benefit of looking at leaders ahead of me at all levels of the government, at all levels of the military, to see what we can bring to education and orthopedics. So I want to go over some definitions. Uh, I want you to know that you can change the world, that, again, teamwork is important. Spend a few minutes on good and bad leadership, and then go over a summary. So fundamentally, we are an all-volunteer force. So I was a volunteer. Everyone I work with is a volunteer. Just like when you sign up for your career in medicine or whatever you're doing, you're a volunteer. We have defined roles and the authorities. We have a clear-cut chain of command, but there are areas where we have earned versus appointed leaders. And there's a misunderstanding about the military that we are basically a command and control organization. Really, that's at the battlefield in a time of war, just like in medicine, when you're doing a code. That's a command and control event. There's a leader of the code, and then everyone else has a defined role. That's a small percentage of what military medicine and military uh, mission is all about. Most of the time, we are, we are not in a bad situation. The reason this picture is here is because this, I was in Washington a couple weeks ago at a leadership meeting, and I was struck by the contrast of Ben Franklin, very well known in University of Penn circles for obvious reasons, leader, in America, etc., and it was in front of the Trump building. And so we have to understand the differences of leaders because in the military, our boss, the commander in chief, POTUS, is an appointed, uh, sorry, an elected civilian, and we follow a civilian. They're not always as well respected as <coughs> other people, such as Ben Franklin in the course of history, but it doesn't matter. 
whoever it is, the commander in chief, that is our commander in chief. The other thing that's sort of a misunderstanding in the military is that because we do wear a uniform and we have a lot of things that we do that are that are you know very uh, well described and we have to follow these sorts of things that they, we, people are misunderstanding that we're about uniformity. We're not about uniformity, but we do have uniforms and standards of conduct and codes. You heard a lot about the definitions of many words today. What I'd like you to take away from this slide is basically leadership is a, is a noun. Lead, to lead is an action verb, to do something, to be, not to, to go forward and, and accomplish goals. And I think that's why it resonates so strongly with uh, surgeons, because we are basically action-oriented people. You heard a lot about integrity, looking in, self-assessment. Simon Sinek basically says it's all about the why. If you don't know who you are, then you cannot be a leader. Even in a system that's hierarchical and very codified, you cannot be a good leader if you don't know the why. You can find people to do the how and the why. There's a couple of things to take away from this lecture. If you want to go on to uh, additional reading or, or YouTubing, uh, make your bet. bet. UT graduation speech went viral. Admiral McCraven, an incredible, inspirational, unbelievable human being and leader. Ninth commander of SOCOM. This man, you, you will just come away like ready to do anything. Ten lessons for life. It starts with make your bed, task oriented, make it happen, and the worst day you have, you come home and you know you already did something. And he talks about changing the world. All the people you meet and what you can do with every human interaction to make it better. And we are so lucky in medicine to be able to have that and take up that challenge to make patients' lives better every day. Teamwork. There's a reason they call it a SEAL team, because that's what it is. Football teams, sports teams, it's a team. We have a medical team. When Dr. Levin says he emails, he says team, because that's what it's about. We share common goals, we're selfless in the pursuit of them, we have focus and determination, and we're going to let nothing get in our way to accomplish that goal. Within teamwork, there's positional authority. What do I mean by that? Well, I learned from when I was in damage control and firefighting in the, in the Navy that, yeah, I'm a doctor, yeah, I'm an officer, but that most junior enlisted man or woman who's next to me that tells me to fix that pipe and fix that hole in the hall and to make those communications work, I'm doing that because I'm not a doctor in that role. I'm there to do damage control of that ship. So when I understand damage control and orthopedic surgery and interaction with my fellow medical people, you bet that really resonates with me. The other thing that's really important to learn about the military personality is, is a fighting hole mentality that I learned from the Marines. What do I mean by that? There is no training timeout when you're in battle. There is no training timeout. There is no half time. There is no place for a Lean Six Sigma model. Just like when that pilot is in flight, just like when we're in the middle of that operating room. There is no stop button. So, if you don't have a well-executed plan ahead of time, and you can't adapt, then you're dead. The patient's not going to do well. And then, if you're in battle, if your team cannot adapt, if the individual people cannot step up to the plate, you're not going to win, you're going to get shot, you're going to get blown up, you're going to die. So believe me, when people are fighting, it's not always about whatever the objective is, the strategy is, the tactics. It's about saving their buddy. And when people say battle buddy, they really mean it. And so that was something that really struck with me my entire 20 years. And so we have an enabled person who's missing their left arm today, just like this Marine. He has no regrets because whatever happens to him, he knows who he is. He knows what he's about. He's always a Marine. He maybe lost his legs, but there's a story there, and that man knows who he is, and he is a leader. He is a leader of men and women, and he is enabled with those prostheses. And orthopedics helped him get there, as well as physical therapy and a host of other people. Another thing I learned was it's the environment, but not the title that determines every leader, but determines a leader. And every level has leaders. So you've heard of short man syndrome. Well, short women syndrome, I'm here to tell you, is even worse. So I'm in the orthopedics in the Navy, and I'm meeting these young Marines. And I was having a little trouble like getting their, it, it, their, their, their attention, trying to talk to them about their medical problems. And so I went to one of their corpsmen, and I said, you know, I'm new to the Navy. 
and maybe I'm not speaking the right language, and I, I'm having a hard time, you know, describing com complications and surgery, and am I using the wrong words? Because there's a different language in the military. And he says, Doc, could you, could you, Doctor, Lieutenant Commander, Demire, man, could we sit, could we talk in your office, man? And I'm like, absolutely. And so we come in the office, he sits down, and he says, you're not a corner. You haven't been in the fleet marine force. You are not their doctor. What do I mean? In the battlefield, and one of the people holding up the flag in Iwo Jima was a pharmacy me. And so that I didn't have their respect because I'm not forward battle deployed, but I, I earned the respect. And so this is what I'm talking about. The people that are out there saving them is, is not my team or me. It's the corpsmen. It's the medics. That's what they see. And then there's triage, and then they, if they're a, a, you know, conscious, they see us for a few minutes, and we take care of them. It's the corpsman, it's the medic that saves them. I want to spend just a few minutes about good versus bad leadership, and I, want, I have the slide here on the right. Time on tradition, basic, basic training, getting yelled at, a little bit like internship residency. There's parts of it that are really great that help make leaders. And you have to start at the beginning with that common goal so that everybody knows we're on the same page. So it's not just yelling at a person. It's making them understand that this is very, very important and you've got to get their attention. So yes, as you heard earlier, good leaders can be made. It's about mentorship, coaching, training, empowerment, and the opportunity to fail with that safety net as well as to succeed. Good leaders, again, understand the mission and vision and core values. You heard all this before. But what I want to really emphasize is that great leaders inspire. That's what they do, whatever they're doing. And they shun fear tactics. They just don't work. And as you've heard before, you've got to demonstrate that empathy and maintain dignity. Positive leadership, you heard about it. It, it, it was a great lecture on that. Um, and, you, and if you want to read a little book about it, this uh, Sean Acor writes about it. But you could bet that this pilot this lieutenant, she's really happy. Why? She was a combat pilot, and then she was one of the few women pilots accepted into pilot, test pilot training for the Air Force. You bet she's happy. It's contagious. Everybody she's going to work with is going to be happy, and you don't get that position unless you know your field, you're a subject matter expert, and you can fly that jet, and you can lead your squadron. So again, I just wanted to, uh, I'll just go through these a little quickly, but really I wanted to emphasize is to train for and expect excellence, and you've got to see success and failure in context. And what I learned from the military was that after action report. Not so much what did we fail at, what did we, what did we succeed at, but where were the near misses? And if it's failure, what did we take away from that? How do we make ourselves better? And don't give up on the team. It's either the leadership has got a problem, meaning myself, <laughs> Or we didn't train them right. We got to train them right because these teams are the future. Um, so on this slide, I just want to make it very clear, and this was something that I really didn't understand until I was maybe like 15 years into my career because I saw all these different types of leadership. Well, guess what? The best leaders can modify their style. So if you're more of a charismatic leader, okay, but you need to change your leadership style depending on what is necessary. And I, I mentioned here General Patton, you heard about Ike already, you heard about General Marshall. He, General Patton, a lot of people just know him from the movie, but he was a very complex character, very complex man. He was a true gifted tactics man, developed tank warfare, still, on, still read today. But the problem was, outside of that environment, he had trouble. So he was basically tailor-made for World War II. After World War II, not so much. And so that General Patton was having some trouble, having some difficulty. And so I, I mentioned that not to, as a lead into <coughs> bad leaders, but that leadership is complicated. And in the early part of my career, what I saw a lot of, unfortunately, was bad leadership. And we can't have that, and we gotta do something about it. And so you have to recognize it first. And, and I have these slides here from the Coast Guard, not because the Coast Guard has bad leadership, but these people need a life preserver and maybe a SAR swimmer, a chopper, and a whole you know, brigade of people to help them. 
They don't communicate, they're inconsistent, they don't reward. Most awful is they squash initiative. They, they, don't, they stop that creativity. And this task-centered <coughs> micromanagement stuff is a killer. It just destroys people. And as you heard before, disrespecting and humiliating people doesn't get you anywhere. Bad leaders put themselves first. They don't understand or violate mission and vision. There's mission creep all over the place, and they really disregard core values. Honor, honor courage, and commitment is ours for the Navy. They don't get it. They, they are risk averse. They're afraid to take even the smallest chances, and they're irresponsible. They use and abuse their staff. They don't have a succession plan. They create a toxic environment. And I'm sorry to say they do break the law, but you know, what are leaders? They're humans. They're people. They're people. And, and just like you heard from our Inspector General, Mr. Gallagher, people sometimes lose their way. And, and I just want you to know that even at the tippy top, admirals, okay, lose their way. Illegal activity. Um, and the number one reason on this slide, you know, for loss, for being removed from command was poor leadership. Poor leadership. And if we, let, if we put in lack of confidence in there, it's certainly the number one. So every organization has its bad apples, and we got to take, take action. Another book that I would mention is that there's such a thing called transformational leadership when you want to make big changes, not necessarily rapidly, but big changes. And this book is written in such a way where when Captain uh, Abershoff took command of the Benfeld, it was the worst ship in the Navy. He made it the best, a destroyer. How did he do it? It was the worst ship. And these chapters, which to me are kind of like the Ten Commandments, is how he specifically did it. It's an easy read. It's definitely translatable to uh, medicine and business. And it's, it's, really it's really, really, really interesting. And you'll see all these common things um, and that you have um, heard today. Lastly, I want to bring up um, Grace Hopper. Um, our computers today are based on these compiling programs which we made, which she made, which is basically taking, you know, binary code, compiler programs, and then what your computer can do for you. Um, she was one of the first uh, admirals, female admirals in the United States Navy, but you know what she was about? She was about people, getting her team, making it happen. You manage things. You lead people. And that's what she was absolutely fabulous at. You already heard this quote before from Professor Kelly, who has led this amazing conference today with Dr. Levin. Uh, and this is basically the takeaway point, besides the fact that you lead people, action-oriented. <coughs> You do the right thing at the right time for the right reason. And sometimes that means listening to your gut. <coughs> you never have all the facts. If you, if, you, if you have all the facts, you've waited too long. So listen to your gut, because when you're self-centered, you know who you are, you know what your core values are, it's really hard to make a mistake. And if you do, your team will forgive you. Fagan is amazing. Uh, I didn't have a lot of mentors at all in orthopedics, and he sought me out. I had no idea who he was. Like, this guy comes over, hey, I'm in my uniform at sports medicine, you know, giving this talk at AOSSM, and uh, he has followed me. He followed me. Like, he is calling me. <coughs> Colonel Fagan is calling me. Hey, how's it going? I heard you had a little rough go. You know, Dean Taylor, who's at Army, you know, tells me that you're having some issues at the Naval Academy. How could I help you? What could I do? Amazing man. Why? Because he saw a capital, he made an investment in me. He, and, and I'm Navy, right? So, but he saw the bigger picture. Amazing man. So what I want to also say is, since I had to tell you at the beginning, I'm passionate about the Navy. We are one team, one fight in the Department of Defense. And I want to take this because, you know, we have sometimes troubles with our colleagues in other departments, other specialties. Our one team, one fight now is, is the patient. And for me, it's one team, one fight, except for one day out of the year. You guys already know what it is. <coughs> Army, Navy, football day. So I just want to say, beat Army. I'm glad they beat us this year, though, because that was getting a little ridiculous. And make your bet. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, team attention, Marlene. Albert Clark. <clears throat> she does welcome talk. Lastly, I want to bring uh, 
my good friend and uh, I said, what better leader can I get to uh, bring some of these principles together? And Brian said it is a uh, superb arthroscopist. I've learned so much from him over the years. Uh, he juggles more balls than anyone I know. At one time he was in a chair and uh, head of sports medicine and team doctor for Penn Athletics. I said, how does he do it? I can tell how he does it. He's honest, he's a man of integrity, and he's one person I know that is very, very skilled at executing on priorities. So Brian, thanks for finishing us up for this morning, for this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, John. Well, I, I've been sitting in the back listening to these uh, lectures and just so inspiring. Um, although one thing that just kind of struck me as we talk about the, uh, the, the leaders, and we're talking about these colonels, and we're talking about uh, Gandhi, and we're talking about all these uh, big people. So, first I just want to uh, uh, raise the hands. Who considers themselves to be a leader here? And who, do, who, we all are interested in leadership, so who considers themselves to be a leader? And who considers themselves to be a follower that strives to be a leader? So, who in this room just thinks of themselves as a leader? And then who is a, they feel like kind of they're a follower, <laughs> but they strive to be a leader. Okay, so we're about 50-50. And, you know, uh, it's kind of interesting, I've been sitting listening to these, and, and um, you're gonna see there's some similar people that have been referenced. Uh, uh, we, have, we have not looked at each other's talks. Uh, uh, Simone uh, Sinek uh, wrote, true leadership is the responsibility of anyone who belongs to the group. Anyone who belongs to the group. So everyone here, really should be thinking of themselves as a leader. And what can I do as a leader? So the thing I'm going to talk about a little bit today is talking about how do we try to put ourselves in those leadership positions. And uh, John often, um, how do I advance this thing? Space work? All right. John often introduced me as the Buddy Ryan of, uh, of Penn Sports Medicine. Now, Buddy's been gone for like about a year now. He was the Eagles coach many years ago. And so I hope it's not because of the hairline or the belly uh, that John refers to that. But it's really that, that Buddy was a, a football coach in the 90s. And it really, it wasn't about him. It was really about all the people around him. And so I always take it as a great compliment when uh, John considers me to be the Buddy Ryan, uh, even though that Buddy sometimes is a little uh, out, outspoken. We talked, um, actually, uh, Dr. Mayo talked about appointed uh, leaders. And so here on the left, we have another person from World War II, uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, we'll go to the back row, uh, Dr. Uh, Josh. Oh, we'll get a couple of Josh up there. We'll go with Dr. Uh, Roselle. Um, who's on the right there, Dr. Roselle? Do you know? No, I don't think so. Charlemagne. Now, do you know who it is? Yeah. Okay, so William Wallace, uh, better known as uh, um, uh, Mel Gibson. And so, uh, so we have a point of leaders. These are the people that sit these high profile levels and lead us into charge, lead us into battle. Um, but we also have the unemployed and appointed leaders. Many times they're in religion. Uh, obviously, we have Jesus, we have Moses. Uh, interesting, John uh, uh, quoted a few uh, quotes from the Bible. And then also a picture of Gandhi. Uh, these are individuals who no one gives them a title, uh, but, they, but they lead people. And so you don't need a title to lead people. So the thing I really make everyone think about is how do I become a leader, even though I don't necessarily have a title? It doesn't take a title to lead. These are two individuals that were around the same time. Um, most people know Martin Luther King on the left. He led, very obviously, uh, a lot of speeches, a lot of things about equal, uh, equal rights. Uh, does anybody know who's on the right-hand side? What's that? General William Wharton. No, it's not the Wharton from Wharton Business School, uh, but this is Clifton Wharton. He's the first CEO of any major uh, 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 large company in the United States. It was TIA Kraft. And he was the first African-American, or at that time, black uh, CEO uh, in that position. He led differently. He actually wrote about it and talked about sometimes style is a, the leading by leadership by example. What kind of leaders are these? Okay, and I, I bet Joshua himself never thought he'd see himself sitting next to Dr. Levin on a, on a, on a slide. Well, the reality is they both have similar positions, but maybe different levels of respect. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're respected differently. So obviously, Dr. Levin, in my mind, embodies what we all strive to be in leadership. But it's no doubt, it's not a surprise though, because he's so driven. He actually has read many, many more books on leadership than many individuals have. He has a passion to be really that consummate leader, and he really understands these principles. But I would tell you that, that Josh Rosell, one of our academic chief residents, 
really has those similar kind of things, but is in a different <coughs> environment. This is a great slide. 99% of leaders are from the middle. No one ever grows up and says, I would like to be vice president of the United States. I never want to play second fiddle in the orchestra. But the reality is we do. Many of us are never going to be at that top spot. Even Dr. Levin, many of us think Dr. Levin is, is a chief, he's, he's the, the uh, chair of orthopedic surgery at the University of Pennsylvania, he's, he's going to be one of the presidents of the, the Hand Society. He has reached this, this level. But he also sits in a position where he has people above him and below him. And he has to negotiate all those individuals. Very few people really, really sit at the very, very top. So the thing I'm going to talk, I'd like to talk about are these arrows. And it comes from this, con this concept of 360 leadership. And it's really, how do we lead up on the right, lead across in the middle, and lead down on, on the left? And you might think that Dr. Levin sits here on the left. He sits above us all in the orthopedics, and he leads down to us. But the reality is that he does the other two equally as well. So leading up, and this is really, you know, when you're, when you're thinking that you're either an intern, you're at the lowest level of your company, you're the, the most insignificant person you perceive in your family, you have the ability to lead up. And what does it mean to lead up? Well, for number one, you have to lead yourself. You have to, and we're gonna talk about it another slide, talk about that. You need to take care of yourself first. You have to be an example to other people. And if people look at you and say, you know, you look at John Kelly, how many times has he been, people talked about him? You know, probably the greatest thing I heard about John Kelly this morning was what the, you said, you know what, I'm, I want to use John Kelly because <coughs> he's the kind of person he is. Forget what you guys are telling me about these other people. I want John Kelly. And that's because of how he conducts himself. Let your leaders low. If you help those above you, they will very much appreciate what you're doing and eventually they're even going to ask your input. Dr. Levin asks Bill residents all the time, you know, what, what their thoughts are, what, 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 what's, what, tell me about the program. Do what others won't. Be that person that steps up and says, I'll do that task. Think of it as residents. Some of these comments are a little bit towards the residents. I still remember being a resident, and I remember that we had people in our program that, you know, hey, that guy's great. He'll, he'll, he'll do what the other guy won't do. And he'll, he'll, he, you know, he's always the one that will pitch in at the end of the day. He'll go scrub that person out. He'll do, he'll, he'll do that extra mile, as they say. Work on relationships. Don't just go through your, whatever you're doing in life. Don't just go through it as you're the only person. Think about the people around you. Get to know the people. Find out about their lives. Be interested in lives. Because caring and interest, it goes a long way to getting people on the same page. So the first thing you really need to do is you need to lead yourself. So we talk about leadership and you know, battalions and like, you gotta lead yourself. So you have to manage your emotions, you have to manage your time, your priorities, when do you do things that you do? Your energy, your thinking, your words, and your personal life. We've talked about, you know, we heard Postmaster General talk about his life balance. That's the, that's the personal life. That's an important part of this whole management process. And, but you have to start with yourself. If you don't manage yourself, no one's really gonna take you seriously in, help, in thinking that you're gonna help, they're gonna, you're, you're gonna help manage them. Leading up, be prepared when you take your leader's time. Some people say that when you sit down and meet with someone you perceive to be your leader, you should spend 10 times that amount of time. So if you're gonna meet with one of the residents, meet with Dr. Levin, you're gonna meet for five minutes, you should spend 50 minutes thinking about what you're gonna talk about. Put in the mental energy in advance. You know, one of, our, one of our great leaders in our department, a guy named Lou Soslowski, you know, um, we know him just as, as you know, someone knows Lou, someone Dr. Soslowski. He's one of the most tr tremendous leaders, uh, researchers in the United States. Um, and before he'll actually ever meet with you, he'll say, what's on the agenda? Do you have an agenda? What are we gonna talk about? He wants preparation, because then that time that you spend, you get the most out of it. Know when to push and when to back off. You know, I like to think I have different, I have, I have a very different relationship with, with, I'll call him Scott in this context, with Scott, than a lot of people do. And I know when I can say, push him, and when I can say, we need to do this, we need to do this. He knows that sometimes I'm the most cynical guy in the world, uh, and, say, and I'll be his counter brain, uh, challenging him. 
But I also know his inflection. I know his volume. I know his mannerisms. I know how to back off. So you got to know where you can push and where you say, okay, that's enough. And you have to figure that out at every phase of your life. Strive to always be better. But these are things like your parents would tell you. But I can't stress it enough. These are the basic things that make you, make you, make you a really good person and put you in a position to lead up. This is a great quote. To do nothing is to create more weight for the top leader to move. If you're not doing stuff, you're a resident, you're PGY4, and you're just like not doing that much work, then your chief's got that much more to do. He's got all, not all the work you're not getting done, he's got to manage you. If you, if you take care of yourself and you're helping take care of everybody else, boy, you just made the leader's job lighter, made it easier. Leading across, I think this is actually the thing that I, I, it, it, and I, I'm always humbled by this. The, sometimes John will introduce me, I'm his boss, I'm not his boss. You know, Dr. Levin may be his boss, his wife may be his boss, God may be his boss, I'm not his boss. But he says that. And, um, and, and I consider, of all people like John Clay, he's my equal. Okay, and so, but how do I help lead him? It starts right from the very top, caring and learning. And yet, you, for someone to, for you to lead someone at your same level, they have to perceive you care about them. Whether you call it, whether it's integrity, whether it's honesty, compassion. Bottom line, they have to realize that you think they matter. And not that they think it, they have to feel that you matter. And if you can make people realize that you really do matter, that's, that's, that's the beginning of everything. Appreciating. And then you figure out how, to, how, to, what, how, do, you, how do you make contributions. Verbalize back to them. Help them come up with a plan. That leads to leading. And then when you succeed, it starts the whole process all over again. And so basically you realize that your, your partner, you really, that word is just it's huge. It's your partner as you move through things. Uh, I can't remember who said it. I think it was, I think it was Kevin. Uh, it's about complete, don't compete. No, that was Jeff who said it. Com complete, don't compete. We don't want to compete against each other. We want to com complete each other. We want to work together. I think Rocky said, you know, other than John Killer. Oh, and, uh, Adrian, uh, she's got gaps, and I got gaps, and together we got no gaps. You know, and, it's, and, and that was from Rocky. You know? So basically, sometimes we all have flaws, but when we put ourselves together, we don't see the flaws anymore. Be a friend. Lead across, really, it's just based on these pure human traits, dignity, respect, value, honesty. If people realize you care, they're going to want to work with you. Some other tips, avoid politics. You know, stay away from all the talking about people. Embrace the best ideas. You know, if John comes up with a better idea than I come up with, embrace it. You know, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And use the people around you. Don't think you're perfect. Don't think you always have the answer. And embrace and um, empower other people to be involved in this process. Leading down, you know, it's again, John Wooden again. Um, know your team. Treat your team well. I picked John, at, um, John Wooden for this for one distinct reason. He was much older. He was near, not nearly the athlete that the guys that he worked with were. Uh, some of them didn't, weren't even in the same race. So he was so totally different. No one would confuse John Wooden with the athletes on that team. But he was part of that team. He treated his team well. He utilized their members' strengths. Be an example. Now, now I gotta come back to Dr. Levin on that one. You know, be an example. You know, he doesn't ask anybody to do what he doesn't do himself. And that's a huge thing. You, what you, said, you, you ask everybody else to do something different and then you, you know, Dr. Levin says, nobody wears scrubs. And he wears scrubs in the hospital. Then we go, well, thanks for this. You know, so, so I don't think you ought to find wearing scrubs. Uh, transfer your vision, let people know what you're thinking about. And reward results. When they achieve it, give them positive feedback. It doesn't have to be, Money it doesn't have to be a gift. It doesn't have to be just a, a thank you, a pat on the back, and that kind word. Letting people want to be appreciated. The, the, our basic core premise: we want to be appreciated. And everything we do, we want to be valued, valued, value and appreciation. So my final thoughts to kind of wrap this up is: everyone can lead. Everyone should think. If we said, who's a leader in this room? Everyone puts their hand because you all have the potential to be a leader. You just have to say, I can be a leader. I don't care. If, Next on my rotation right now, I'm a medical student here. Great, excellent medical student. 
Still got a week left on that. Uh, so, but he's doing a great job. And he can be a leader. Really? He can be a leader. He's a medical student. He can be a leader. Okay. Um, make an impact. Be involved. Improve your leadership. Improve your organization. Many people will realize if I make my organization better, I make me better. And we make why do why do we work hard for teams like baseball teams and football teams to win? If our team works better, we all win together better. Helping others helps yourself. And helping yourself helps other people. So together you can do get a lot of things done if you all become leaders. Thank you. Thank you all for staying, and I hope you got as much out of this morning as I did. Thank you, Mr. Hunter.